infographic number 15 has some more sun symbolism. This time it's in a different direction than the quaternity four phases. I'll be getting into dual symbolism. So at the center here we have the sun represented by the truth and the light and then we have the earth going around its orbit and when the light of the sun which is the truth reaches the earth makes contact and produces heat and heat is symbolic of justice just as light is symbolic of truth because the heat is generated when there's a friction energy and friction interference conflict pressure all has to do with catalyzing change from one polarity to another such as evil to good it requires heat and justice in order to remove the injustice and apply justice in order to bring things back into balance with ma'at which is truth order law etc also when the light of truth produces the heat of justice that's when we get life because when the light reaches the hurt the earth and produces heat on the earth then we get life on earth as without the sun there would be no heat or light on earth and there would be no life on earth so symbolically the truth and justice is what allows us to produce real life true life actual life authentic life higher life etc now this has been symbolized in Consciousness and Causality Part 1, and it will be symbolized, I guess, a bit more in what's coming up. But I've already talked about it as well in terms of the real life, the afterlife, the mortal life, eternal life, heaven, paradise. I've talked about this many places in my other older work as well, in terms of creating a heaven instead of a hell on earth, and how the knowledge of good and evil and morality is required to make that happen. So sun, light, heat, air, and sky is symbolized by the same thing. And we have truth and justice, uh, the right hand of God and righteousness as well in that symbolism. The light of the sun and stars reaches the surface of the earth to generate heat and support life. Life in the occult esoteric symbolism is eternal life, immortality, afterlife, paradise, heaven, etc., the light of ma'at and truth generates the heat, friction, and interference of justice to injustice and falsity. Light of truth and heat of justice. Fire, heat, and light used to cleanse and burn away impurities to sanitize, uh, sorry, to, to burn away impurities and to sanitize. Below the surface of the earth there is no light, no heat, no air, and no life. It is of death, darkness, cold, and blind. As I've mentioned before, the air itself, through the personification of the god Shu, he was the breath of life, symbolically characterized. And when you don't have the breath of life, the Ankh, that's symbolic of being below the earth where the light does not reach, so you don't have the heat, you don't have air, and you don't have life. That's why sun, light, heat, air, and the sky are symbolic of life. Sun, light, and truth is the path to life through the heat of justice. It is the path of the seven, quote, spirits of good, or, quote, God, the seven virtues and values, the path of the two witnesses of truth and justice, those two witnesses which are the first and the seventh, the first and the last. The path of light, sun, and truth to create life is the way of living in Ma'at. And that's true life, authentic life, real life, higher life, etc. This is the central wisdom to life that is part of any worthwhile mystery tradition. And the all, all worthwhile mystery traditions have this component of morality as the central aspect of life. That's why I say all the alleged channeled entities, whether they're real or not, I, I'm not going to say they're not real, 
What if you believe them to be real? Then look at their information. What do they talk about? If you look at information such as the, the highly popular uh, Law of One, allegedly channeled from Ra, and you have um, conversations with God, and you have all these other things, and, and, and all this stuff, you will not hear people talking about objective morality. None of these channeled entities care about this, just like Weather, Richard Weatherill said in his um, understanding of these alleged entities that they were evil and we were the good ones. We were at the pinnacle of evolution. And we are. They're trying to stagnate us. Maybe make us into body vehicles for them to take over or whatever. I don't know. Just conceptions. But in terms of what Richard Weatherill in uh, Be Right or Go Wrong, um, it makes sense. Because I don't trust what they say. They don't talk about anything of importance. All they talk about is spec speculative conceptions and they cloud and confuse into moral relativism. They make people go into moral relativism. Look at any of them. They're all bullshit fucking crap. They have some truth. Of course you have some truth. And a lot of it is feel-good bullshit because people want to feel good about themselves and their misery of self-created uh, enslavement and self-imposed suffering that they create upon themselves and others. So everyone wants to feel good. Everyone's focused on the pleasure trap. Everyone wants to feel good. So when we hear things, we want to feel good about what we hear. We don't want to hear things that, that bring us down a bit. We want to we want to stay up in the clouds and in the, the ecstasy clouds of uh, imagination, believing whatever we want to believe. So this is the central wisdom of any worthwhile mystery tradition. It is about life here and now. Here and now that we can create into a heaven, not a hell. There is no greater concern than this life, not other imagined, quote, soul lives somewhere else. Other realms, other dimensions, other planes of existence, zero, absolutely zero concern to me, as I don't live there. I live here. I live in this reality, this plane of existence, and this is where I live from birth to death, and this is where I occupy my existence, and where I have a purpose and meaning to end evil and create good so that we can finally live as a heaven on earth and finally live in truth in Ma'at. But no, people don't want to accept reality. They want to create phantasmagorical conceptions like souls and entities and make that the focus of their life, even if it is true, even if there is a soul somewhere else. Even if there is another personality uh, elsewhere, even if there is these channeled entities, even if there is all these soul groups and imagined things, and the sun is the Archangel Michael, which used to be uh, Thoth, and used to be the Tetragrammaton, and used to be Metatron, and all this stuff, and the sun was the, the demigod, demiurge, creator of our solar system, and this is how it all works in different solar systems, and all the planets are gods themselves, and Gaia, and I don't give a shit about any of that. All that is fantasy land storytelling it has no bearing whatsoever in how I live my life. None. At all. What it does do, it gets you trapped into these uh, fanciful stories and narratives about things that are bigger than you, about uh, these wondrous uh, infatuated ideas and these new concepts, the novelty, these new things that didn't exist before and now you're going to believe they're existing and actual and it's a real reality when all it is is an imagined story told to you. So anyways, this is the beginning of understanding the importance, not the beginning, but I've already been talking about it, but this will help in understanding the importance of the sun, light, and heat, and the air and sky, and how that's above, and that's the Ankh, and that's real life, and that's why the wheel goes that way, and that's why that's the right direction to take and not go down towards the earth, even though this is pointing towards the earth and to bring life, yes, but in terms of the dual path, of good and evil, well, one is good, and that's sun, light, heat, air, sky, and one is bad, and that's the earth. When you're talking about dual, dualistic, uh, dualistic symbolism of good and evil, the air and the earth play opposite each other in terms of respectively corresponding to good and evil. So, infographic 16, we have the sun again with the truth and light. And the truth equates to justice, where you have heat. And if you don't have heat below the earth, you have cold. And the cold is a lack of justice. 
So injustice. And if you don't have heat, because and it's cold and you don't have light, well then it's dark, and that's a lack of truth. So you have the whole sun, the higher sun, and then you have the black sun. So now we're in, I'm not playing off of um, the rebirthing um, cycle of raw symbolism that I've done in infographic five or six. We're not talking about that. Now we're talking about dualism here. We're not talking about the quaternity and a quaternal process. We're talking about dual, two processes. So now here I'm talking about the black sun, the dark sun, the cult of the dark sun, Set and Seth. How people have uh, transformed that symbolism of Seth and Set into a completely dark negative aspect. So there's the cult of Saturn and the domination of Saturn. and Saturn as Kronos, you know, and eating all of his children and all this stuff and the father of time. I guess that's another symbolism. But... Uh, it's, it's, I'm playing in the dark and the light symbolism, good and evil. So we have air and earth is the counterplaying symbolism. Not fire and water, but air and earth. So we have ascension, higher, lighter. We ascend to wisdom, not fantasy beliefs and pleasure, but consciousness life arising, raising like the sun does. So it's raising your consciousness. The life of consciousness is what's raising. And in the earth we have the pleasure attachment. Pleasure. Uh, physical attachment. Pleasure. Carnal. Flesh. Ignorance of wisdom. The wisdom is cast below. It's not there anymore. Because you're, you're not fixated on... You're not... You're not desiring and caring for truth and light. You have an apathy for truth and light, which means a lack of truth, which means you're in dark. And you have a lack of justice and heat, which means you're in cold. So again, we have um, the sun and the stars. And this is uh, symbolic of the Ten Commandments on two stone tablets, two tablets of st uh, stone. So again, the two, the two again is coming into play either as the, the two witnesses of truth and justice, as to how um, Ten Commandments for Truth and Justice, or the, the, the two tablets of knowledge of the two truths of good and evil, the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil, which is contained symbolically on the mountaintop, or the wisdom, or uh, the, the capstone of the pyramid, which I have an image here. So we have... Um, Wisdom is reaching for the light of the sun and stars. And we get there by being at the peak and the pinnacle, the highest point that we can climb to. Which is what knowledge is representative of. You have knowledge and understanding and wisdom in terms of the trinity of consciousness related to the trivium. But wisdom can have two aspects applied to it. Level 1 is the wisdom of what is the right thing to do, and level 2 is actually living the right way, which is, I guess, righteousness. Wisdom of right action would be righteousness, and then level 1 wisdom would just be understanding. So we have a body of knowledge as the pyramid or the mountain, and you climb up the pyramid to get to the capstone. You climb up the body of knowledge to get to the peak, pinnacle, and highest point. Also the, the bigger base knowledge and the representatives of all that knowledge through the, the microcosm to the macrocosm of all knowledge. The microcosm has uh, the source, kernel, uh, knowledge and wisdom and truth. So the light of the stars and the sun, that's the light of truth. And we're climbing up to get to the top. The wisdom, which is reaching for the suns and the stars, the highest point that we can reach. We can never get the whole truth itself, but we can reach relative uh, inclinations and ascensions, and certain bodies of knowledge, uh, certain paths of uh, inquiry and subjects. We can reach the top and see a lot about it. We can't know everything about truth, but we can reach the top of the peaks and pinnacles and highest points of many things symbolically. And there's also um, images you'll see in maybe part two, if not part one at the end. Um, the ascension and the grades of the the Jed pillar, Jed pillar, D J E D, uh, the Jed pillar with the Ankh on top, and then the arms outstretched holding up the sun, 
So again, we have the pillar of stability and truth from the earth going up to the sky, from the lower to the higher. And then on top of that, we have the cross. But not only the cross, we have the Ankh cross. So again, to higher, even higher into the air with uh, the Rue Oval, the, uh, the half of the infinity sign going up. And then above that, we have the arms. Uh, they're not upright and, and perfectly right like uh, the Ka arms, but they still are ka, uh, arms as the beetle holds uh, the sun, the scarab beetle, uh, Kepper, Kefir. Um, the Ankh is holding the, 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 the red sun disk up to hold it up above. So it's all uh, higher and lower symbolism to reaching higher states. And uh, this is the pillars of four. It's symbolizing of, of going from the ground up as a stable foundation towards truth. Uh, the cross as well. Uh, and the Ankh for towards life and the breath of life and the air symbolism. And then on top of that, you have the Ka, which is the, the nature, essence, and character of our deeds and actions. And that leads us to grasp the sun the truth, the light in our hands, by what we do with our hands and our arms. And that's living in the truth and light, living in, well, representative of the sun, but it's representative of Ma'at. Ma'at is the overarching, before the sun there was Ma'at. Okay, the, the creator God, from the research I've done, um, Atom, self-created, but there was no sun yet. Um, the sun is represented through Ra later as the creator god, which then gets transposed onto aspects of Atom. But uh, first was the creator god, then there was um, Shu and Tefnut, which was life and Ma'at, life and order, life and truth, life and law. Then, after that, there was Newt and Geb, which was sky and earth. And then I think from them came Ra, or was that in an Heliopolis? You know, there's Memphis, Heliopolis, there's different places in Egypt, each of them had their own gods and changed over time. As time changes, they adopted gods from other places and they all got mixed matched, and it's all symbolic, it's not literal. People need to stop looking at narratives and stories and symbols as literal things, because they're not. So whenever you read a narrative, and you... <laughs> Someone's explaining it to you as as the exoteric narrative, as it's exoterically expressed, in terms of all these this imagery and symbolism as literal things. So there's a there's a literal Osiris and there's a literal beast uh, Kamat, and it's going to eat your heart if it doesn't lay way up to Maat, and Maat's a literal goddess, and all are all literal things. No, they're not literal things. It's all symbolic. Everything since the creation of symbols by people who understood what symbols were were in terms of representing ourselves they knew what they were doing and then there's idiots who don't understand the power of symbols pretty much all of humanity until you do understand the power of symbols and you believe in symbols literally so people read the the bible oh my god the bible the word of god blah 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 it's literal word of god and it's so ridiculous how people do not understand language and reality and how they reflect each other and the purpose of symbols, the imaginative symbols to reflect aspects of ourselves onto reality. Symbols that actually mean something and make sense and have a purpose in our life. Of course you can make symbols of imagination that have absolutely no relevance and convince people that they're relevant. So yeah, create, uh, create a soul, create a karma, Create an afterlife, create reincarnation, and create uh, recycling, rebirthing processes in order to ascend or create uh, concepts of, uh, of 40 negative uh, confessions, 42 negative confessions of Ma'at, so that you can uh, live your life according to the rituals that uh, the priest, controllers, and Pharaoh wants you to, so that you can uh, become... Uh, Live in Ma'at and get uh, the proper power of Ka so that you can become a living. A living was uh, a term they used in, uh, to describe those of uh, the gods and the pharaohs were the living. Everyone else wasn't the living. It all had to do with the, the Ka and the power of your Ka and how much you upheld Ma'at and goodness. But it was all bullshitly divinely inspired and it's all just divine narrative. So because the pharaoh was divine, 
Well, he had the divine Ka of the gods, because the gods had the Ka, the most powerful, and, and on earth, well, it was only the, the Pharaoh that had the, the most powerful Ka, because he's divine from the gods, and blah, 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 all the bullshit stories of how to validate justification for central authority and rulership over others. It's the same story in all cultures, it's the same thing, because consciousness is the same everywhere, there's just variations in our ego personality identity constructs, but consciousness operates the same, we all have the same underlying functionality. That's why I say the ancient wisdom from pre-flood, pre-ice age was taken, there's some people who had, were more advanced morally than us, maybe not technologically with our attachments and all our, our candy of technology and our titillations of technology, they were more advanced morally and which would quote spiritually, which is what morality is really. The real morality, the real spirituality is morality. So they were more advanced spiritually, i.e. morality, morally. And so they had all this knowledge. But then when sh uh, the cataclysm happens, people get dispersed, and then that symbolism gets applied through a telephone line process over time, and it gets changed and altered. Different symbols get adopted. The meaning gets changed. The importance gets changed. And then the, the message gets changed over time. And then there's people who know the original symbolism that have applied an exoteric cover layer narrative to explain that esoteric symbolism, but use the exoteric layer as a method of control through rituals and belief systems. Which is what Egypt did, I'm sure of it, the second group of Egyptians starting uh, you know, eight to 6,000 years ago that came into the, the Nile Delta and, and uh, rehabited the area. Those are not the original Developers of the three Giza pyramids are very different than all the others. Uh, those three pyramids are not used for burials, whereas the others were. Um, it's just a people from before and a people after, and there's a mixing going on, and knowledge from before and knowledge after, and people who know the knowledge from before are using it and twisting it and creating exoteric manipulations in order to manipulate people and have them um, in buy into what they are selling as um, pre-selected, pre-ordained pathways in life. Now this is more so in the caste system in India, but in Egypt it was done as well. In terms of the pharaoh upholds ma'at, the pharaoh lives by ma'at, everyone else needs to live by ma'at, so you need to follow what the pharaoh says. He is the divine ruler, he has the most ka. The ka is uh, the spirit double, and the most powerful is in the pharaoh and the gods, and then you guys, well, you're not you're not as important, so you don't have as much, and you're not the living compared to everyone else. Then this later gets changed over time to get more uh, complacency from the populace, where people are are brought into um, conceptions of the divine afterlife through the narratives of the eternal judgment, whereby they had a chance to reach eternity by living according to the 42 negative confessions of Ma'at and then you could reach the afterlife. But it wasn't by understanding things objectively, morality objectively, right and wrong objectively, it was just do as you're told and reach the afterlife. That's how I see it, because it's the same across all cultures, but again, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of infatuation and uh, love bombing and uh, orgy, uh, intellectual orgy with uh, Egypt that people view certain things that they said and oh my god Egypt's the best place and there was no there was no prisons and there was no crime and there was no nothing like give me a break that they have such an infatuation with this again it's a naturalist fa fallacy ancestral fallacy it's because they view themselves as coming from there just like you have Anatoly Fomenko in history history fiction or science he has his infatuation with Mother Russia, with the Rus, and the Rus was the great empire of the past, and la 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 la, and the great Rus empire. Maybe it was the Egyptian empire, and the Rus empire was the same thing. Maybe it was all one global empire, I don't know, but everyone wants, they believe that where they come from, they're so special, and that's where they come from, and that place is the most special place, and this is all attachment to self. When you view yourself as a special, special place in the universe, you're so powerful and unique and special. And that's why we have all these answers to questions in order to make us feel special and feel good. Provide answers to questions to 
give us a sense of ourselves and a sense of reality, a uniqueness, a specialness and reality about how powerful and special we are. Psychology and attachment is a huge part to symbolism and belief and getting towards knowledge. Huge, huge, huge part. Symbolism, ah, sorry, attachment and uh, and psychology. Psychology and attachment, big, big things. Infographic number 17. Now we're going to get into the duality aspect. So this is where, this is why we go to air from fire and not start at earth. We don't start from the earth, we start from the air. We don't go to the earth, we go towards the air in the proper direction. So when you start the quaternity process, you go into dualism process. Do you go for the air or do you go for the earth? So in the movement of our, of our desires of fire to the air thoughts to the water actions to the earth results, that's the, the quaternity process cycle. But within that, when we start with our desire and our care, we have to choose. Now this is where the symbolism of the duality comes in. Choose between the earth or the air symbolism. And that's symbolism of the air as ma'at, order, law, and love, truth, or the earth as isfet, chaos, fear, and falsity. So we have a right hand ascends to the light, vision, life, and righteousness, or the left hand descends to darkness, blindness, death, and wickedness. Because the right hand ascending to light, vision, life, and righteousness is the right way. And that's true care, and that's good. So it's above, high in the sky. So you'll recognize the symbolism from causality and consciousness part one. It's above, high in the sky, higher consciousness. Quote, God, the good generator. That's the ruler of sky and heaven. It's a high desire. Seek truth and morality. Now conversely, when you go towards the earth, as the left hand descending to darkness, blindness, death, and wickedness, that's the wrong way. That's dark care, evil. So you have low desire, lust for pleasures instead of a high desire to seek truth and morality. This is where you're in physical attachment, like in infographic number six, I have and the pleasures and the lust and the carnal, beastly, uh, low base consciousness. And also in truth, natural law, heaven and hell, Bible symbolism. Last year I've talked about this. So we have below, low to the ground, lower consciousness. Quote, devil as the evil generator and the ruler of earth and hell. That's why the devil is seen as the ruler of earth and hell. You understand how it's all symbolism? Then people take it literally. Ah, the devil exists and the devil's the ruler of earth and earth is hell. Ah, the earthly blah, blah, blah. Oh, earth is bad. No, it's symbolism. People don't understand symbolism and imagery. It is so powerful to understand how powerful imagery is. To understand symbols and the images they invoke in us and how they can alter our understanding of reality is, is amazing. So, this is symbolized as the light sun, the eye of Horus and Ra. And at the bottom we have the black sun, or the... Saturn, the dark cult, the cult of Saturn, the cult of Seth, the cult of Set. This is Apep and Apophis that is slayed in uh, a symbolism in Egypt. When you slay the Apep or slay Apophis, that's uh, slaying the negative. And then you also have apophatic learning, which is learning through the negative in order to know the good. So you'll learn the negative in order to know the good. You learn the negative so that you can put to death the negative. You learn the negative and the positive. You learn the good and the evil so that you can put to death the evil within you and then externally help other people do it and then at a certain point when other people don't want to do it well then evil is just put to death period you, you put it down someone's trying to murder you you're not going to have a nice conversation about how oh well they they're engaging in evil and they need they need to put to, to death the evil within them and do some inner work on themselves no well, someone's trying to kill you guess what happens there you either do something about it or you don't. You either do something about it and don't die, 
or you let them murder you. It was very simple to understand. And that's when you live in right. And you live in truth and you live in morality. You put evil down. You exterminate evil. We need a lot more truth warriors before we can get to that point of actually stopping evil outright through force. Maybe centuries. It doesn't work when there's too many little people. All you have to do is look at uh, a few hundred years ago and uh, abolitionists. There were different types of abolitionists. Some of them, I agree with them, they were, they were killing slavers. But because the laws were still immoral laws, it was viewed as murder. And they were tried as murderers. But the people enslaving other people, oh, they weren't evil. No, no, no. They, but they were evil in reality, in moral objectivity, they were evil, and they were put down by good. It didn't matter that the evil didn't want to stop. You got to stop it. And these were, these were righteous people. They just didn't understand. They were going too far for the amount of, for the consciousness of the populace. Because this is what happens when you don't have the numbers. You do the right thing against evil, and because everyone's living in evil, evil lives under the veil and guise of good, your actions to stop evil will be seen as evil instead of as good, and you will be treated as evil instead of as good. That's why there's a, a critical mass and a certain uh, number factor, quantum amount, that is required in order to put down evil overtly as we do. The, co the consciousness of people needs to be on the side of good in order to recognize what is evil, in order to exterminate evil. That's why the knowledge of good and evil is so pivotal to understand. Two truths. Double truths. Ma'ati. The hall of Ma'ati. The hall of two truths. What could that represent? Hmm, maybe it has to do with the two truths of the knowledge of good and evil and how that allows you to either remain in a hell or ascend to a heaven that you create on this earth. It's all symbolic. So the reality we create and live in as humans is a product of wisdom of right action or foolishness of wrong action. We choose the right hand or the left hand path. That's why when you'll get to the Ka symbolism, I think in three, two more infographics you'll see it first come up. It's the, the left hand on one side and the right hand on the other. That's what it sim symbolizes. Symbols symbolize a lot. It's pictorial, pictorial, pictograph symbolism is very descriptive and has many layers that can be applied to it. And the Ka symbolism, if you go do your research on the Ka, hardly anyone understands it properly. And the Ka and the Ba and the Ak, not the Ankh, but the Ak, these are the three main aspects of, uh, of the self that the Egyptians viewed. Well, they had seven or eight aspects of the self. They even viewed your name, which was arbitrarily chosen, and could be anything that your parents choose to name you. They viewed the name as an important aspect of yourself, as who you are, as it was, as a, as a defining, um, like character and it relates to who you are and, and your abilities and what you do in life, that your name is that important. Well, sorry, Egyptians, this is a, this is one part where you need to assess what is accurately important in life in terms of symbolism and then what is just exoteric bullshit. So when they're talking about the importance of your name, well, have fun, laugh at it. I laugh at it. There's a lot of ridiculous notions. Oh, you're going to feed your ka, yeah, your spirit. you got to feed it food. They, they Exoterically, in the exoteric narratives, this is what they're teaching. This is what many Egyptologists believed. But they don't understand the deeper encoded wisdom from the ancient civilization that was before that. Or that was derived earlier in the, in the civilization, but then was used as controlling purposes for the uh, the select few to control the masses by having the exoteric esoteric wisdom encoded through the veil of exoteric narratives. I personally think that an ancient pre-flood, pre-ice age wisdom existed that got perverted and used into 
a masculine dominator controlling modality of living as expressed through all of the post flood post flood post ice age uh, narratives from Sumer to Egypt to everywhere else had male domination very high up there going up to uh, 6000 BC all those narratives you go earlier than that then you can get some more feminine um, predominance in terms of the, the vulture symbolism and the feminine symbolism and the mother goddess symbolism so even older than that there seems to be the more of a of a mother goddess symbolism as opposed to a father god symbolism creator anyways that's a tangent issue so another aspect of symbolism when I was doing this I, I remembered um, this uh, happened to my dad when he was in school too even though he wasn't in a religious school it's pretty ridiculous how it still perpetuates. Do not write with your left hand. They would smack your hand with a ruler. You know, not everyone can write with the left hand, the right hand, whatever. It doesn't depend on your name. That's not how it works. It has nothing to do with your name, okay? It has nothing to do with anything else. It's just you write with your left hand, you write with your right hand. But I was viewed as, as evil, as wicked. Why? Again, understand the symbolism. The left hand symbolism. What does that symbolize? That's why they didn't want to allow you the church, the nuns. They didn't. They abused children. They did evil upon people under the veil of good, doing evil under the veil of good, pretending that someone who's doing nothing harmful is doing evil. So the children who are innocent, writing with their left hand psychopathic dominator men and women in the church abuse them and beat them because they were writing with a hand that they symbolically associated with evil chaos fear and falsity the devil lower desires with below and lower consciousness dark and evil it's all symbolism about consciousness but they took it as literal because they were stupid church idiots stupid religionists why well, they don't understand how to derive knowledge of ourselves and reality themselves. They need to believe what other people are bullshitting them and, and selling them. So they buy into all these religious fanciful bullshit. And then you got all these sects, sects and cults of religions. Christianity has like 50 denominations or whatever, you know. Jehovah, Presbyterian, uh... You know, Catholic, uh, just Christian, just uh, Latter-day Saints, Mormon, and blah, 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 all little derivations, all little minor belief adjustments, nothing, nothing based in truth, all just belief. Yeah, there's underlying truth and wisdom that get people buy into, and oh, God and good and truth and the goodness, and but it's all belief, makes you feel good, makes you feel connected to give yourself to something bigger. Religion is a poison upon this planet. People believe, oh, religion's not the plan, uh, not the problem, blah, blah. Yes, it is the problem. Religion is good. Give me a break. Religion is good. Just some learning about history. Religion was created by man and used by man to manipulate man. That's where religion has been done everywhere, everywhere across the planet since the beginning of the invention of religion. So, there's also the aspect of, well, they're doing it for good, to help us along the good path, control us for good, or control us for evil. But when you're using control, and manipulating people, and developing rituals to have them do things without having them understand why it's good and why it's necessary, well then you can manipulate them into doing good, or you can manipulate them to doing evil as if it were good, because they're not in a critical mind self-consciousness and soul they're not able to think for themselves they don't think critically they don't think for themselves they don't question they don't doubt and they're not curious so they just accept what they're sold they buy into what they're sold that's what happens in all religions I've been through belonging to a 
know, any conception. Oh, I'm connected, becoming the higher self, becoming the true self, becoming the truth, as, as something that exists as an absolute somewhere else. That's just a conception in our minds in order to give uh, a form of actuality, of concreteness to something somewhere else that doesn't actually exist as a thing in itself, so that we can feel connected to it. It's all psychological, attachment, pleasure-based, feel-good-based. So this dual symbolism, again this comes from causality and consciousness part one. We have air, quote, heaven, quote, afterlife, salvation, elysium, ma'at, isis, the right hand, order, where we're alive, life, light, sight and vision, higher consciousness, quote, spiritual, higher self, truer self, service to truth and morality, evolved, transformed, quote, of the spirit. And the opposite is earth, hell, underworld, perdition, Tartarus, isfet, eris, left hand, chaos, dead, death, dark, blind, lower consciousness, physical lower self, false self, service to self, pleasure and comfort, carnal, beastly, of the flesh. So nature, essence, and the spirit of deeds is morality and that regulates the nature and quality of life and reality. So it's important. You're going to choose the right hand or the left hand. You're going to go up or you're going to go down. The light or darkness, vision or blindness, life or death, righteousness or wickedness. Which one are you going to choose? Because if you do not know objectively what good and evil is, what right and wrong is, then guess what? You are walking the dualistic checkerboard path and way of amoral, beastly, dual good and evil living. You're going to be thinking you're living good, but you're living evil, because you do not have the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what allows us, once evil exists and is created, it allows us to recognize evil as existing and refrain from creating it in an apophatic sense to refrain and, and abdicate ourselves from generating that into reality and in choosing the other polarity instead. But if you don't have knowledge of good and evil, when evil is being created and you're creating it, then you're just going to keep creating it into the future and you're going to progressively degenerate. So I guess that's the end of Infographic 17. So Infographic 18 is the exact same thing as 17, but I've just added a uh, correspondence to the previous symbolism in terms of the pyramid and the up and down, higher and lower, and how this relates. So you can see the pyramid here uh, from the base, and we reach up to Ma'at through the, the pinnacle of the mountain or the pyramid, and we have the wisdom reaching for the light and the truth of the sun and the stars, which is Ma'at, the truth represented in Ma'at or represented in the air, and the sky and the sun, same symbolism, or they describe the same aspects of symbolism. So that's all. That's the only difference in this infographic is this additional pyramid. Infographic number 19. Here we have some more dualism symbolism. So here I have the infinity symbol applied. So this time it's not in terms of consciousness above and, con and existence below. This time it's, uh, it's in terms of good and evil. And it, the flow, um, well, it doesn't, they don't go into each other. They don't go from good to evil, good to evil. I'll explain that. So we have God. Symbolic of God, heaven, Elysium, sky, air, and at the bottom, devil, hell, Tartarus, earth. So from our desires, we can care and choose the right-hand path and way of righteousness, truth, good, justice. Or we can choose the left-hand path and way of wickedness, foolishness, and falsity. We desire and care to do certain things. We think about how to do them. And we then generate through those thoughts and desires to produce actions, deeds, and behaviors. So this is linking... Uh, this dual aspect of good and evil to the, the quaternity process of how we generate in reality. So we choose the left or the right hand path, and then with that choice of our care and desires, 
then we follow the normal path of the quaternity from fire, air, water, earth, and producing in reality. So we have ma'at on the top and isfet on the bottom again. Ma'at is righteousness, truth, justice, order. The right hand, sun, light, heat, life, all that symbolism. And on the bottom, isfet, symbolic of chaos, injustice, falsity, wickedness. The left hand, dark, cold, and death. So the, the two main... Even though there's the, the two main symbolism of the air and earth as uh, polar opposites playing off each other, respective of good and evil, you still have, as I've mentioned before, the two axes are, are always in play. Um, you can have the quaternity where all four are together, or you can have the two as two separate lines, two separate things going on. One is the vertical axis of good and evil of Ma'at and Isfet. The other one is the horizontal axis of our desires and cares leading towards um, change in time through our actions and deeds. And again, time symbolized by the 8, which is why I drew the 8. If you go look at infographic four, uh, 5 or 6 on the raw wheel symbolism, and there I have the two infinite signs, and that connects um, the desires to the, the the deeds, and it connects the righteousness with wickedness, with good and evil. And in terms of this representation here, where you have your desires going to your actions, and you have um, the choice between good and evil that uh, lead to your actions and deeds, what happens. So here I have the Ka. The Ka is a symbol of the arms. Right now I have it on its side because that's how it's represented, as we have the left side and the right side, right? Left hand and the right hand, well then you got to put the ka sideways. Or you could flip this image around and then you'd have, instead of a horizontal for blue and red, you'd have a vertical, red on the left and blue on the right, and then your ka would be right hand and left hand, and that'll be coming up in, uh, I think, the next infographics anyways. So your ka, um, you're choosing the true care of good or the dark care of evil. You know, the right side ascends to light, life, and vision, and the, the left side descends to darkness, death, and blindness. So from your desires and care, you're following the arrow. You can either go with the arrow, or you can go with the, the circle. So from your desires and cares, what we're doing is we're trying to get from our desires and cares to the other end of the horizontal, to our actions and deeds in time that produce change. Okay, so we're trying to get over there. But what happens when we get to the midpoint? We have a choice to make. From our desires and cares, we get to the midpoint of the cross. We need to go either up to good or down to evil. You can either take, um, or you can take the uh, the half of the infinity spiral, and it goes goes down on the left side, and then up on the right side, and then it outputs back out on the straight line, back out to actions and deeds. Or you can go um, towards the good on the left. And then it loops back around to the right down arrow, back down to the midpoint, and then you're outputting back out as your actions and deeds based on that choice. Or you can go around the, the, the circumference. So you go from your desires and cares, you go upwards, the up arrow to the midpoint, to your good, and then you can go back down on the other side, the left side, to your actions and deeds. Same thing with evil at the bottom, you go downward around the circumference of the circle, and then you go back to the, the midpoint, upwards. So you can look at it in both those ways, either externally through the circumference of the circle, or internally trying to get from one side to the other, but passing through the midpoint. Once you're at the midpoint, you have to make a decision. Either you go into the top part of the infinity loop or the bottom part of the infinity loop, which ends up looping back around to the midpoint, and then you output back according to that desire and care for good or evil that then creates your actions and deeds. And of course there's thought involved, but we'll just put that as part of desires and cares, as part of the heart, the ib, which was the heart and mind, which is just essentially consciousness itself, us. So downward is desires of the flesh, carnal, beastly, low, consciousness of acting in physical desires, worldly desires, hence the pleasure trap, which I've written about before. 
it's not the right way to go the left hand. The right, right way is the right hand. So again, even in the right hand, the right way, it's all in, even in the words, the right way, the right hand. If you go the left hand, that's the wrong way, and that's why the quaternity symbolism goes um, from fire to air to water to earth as they're represented in nature, because that's the way they happen in nature, and that's the way we choose good over evil is to go upwards as well. So it's always about going upwards and not downwards. So right is the right hand towards the higher nature of air, mind, thought, and figure out the right the right way to earth through actions that ground us in right results. So we've been going the wrong direction, the wrong way, thereby traversing time against the natural order, which is the hard and stupid way. Infographic number 20. This I have, uh, this is Ka, simply as the Ka, how, how it's represented. So the Ka symbol is just upright arms and hands. It's the other right angle, right angle, right angle, the right way, right angle. Get it? Okay? So the Ka itself, now whenever I see arms outstretched, upholding things, those are actions of upholding, and that's the spirit, the essence, the nature of the arms, hands, actions, and deeds of those gods, such as Shu, such as Hu, and such as He. They uphold, uh, and Nun. Nun also upholds. So the, this is the power of their Ka as gods. So it's, Ka is just the, is the spirit, essence, and nature from the hands, arms, actions, and deeds. Clearly, the Ka represents our hands and our arms, and our actions and our deeds. What else could hands and arms represent? And it's, it's interpreted as symbol, it's interpreted as, quote, double, right, double, you have a left and a right hand path, a good and evil, two truths. Are you going to choose, choose the truth of what is evil, or the truth of what is good, and what to follow in life, and how to hack, act, and the deeds you perform through your, your hands and your arms? So it's upright arms, the moral, spirit, essence, and nature, character, behavior, actions, deeds. And ka can be seen in the words character and charisma, which directly relate to our uh, us, our essence and our nature, our moral uh, character, behavior, from our actions and deeds. Our character is a character and charisma, all from our car, our arms and our hands. That's why the, the symbolism has many layers, but in most, if you go research this, there's many, many interpretations. Most of them revolve around soul, spirit, or life force, or double. But you need to understand what real life is, that it's not talking about uh, a soul somewhere else and a spirit somewhere else and a life somewhere else. It's talking about life here. Eternal life. How do you get eternal life and afterlife here? The real life, as I've been talking about, truer life, authentic life, the higher life. That's why the arms are holding up the sun in a lot of instances, and the scarab beetle. It's all about the symbolism of our hands as the spirit and the essence, the nature of who we are as a double in terms of both the self we are we can't the, the two forms of self we can be as a as a falser self or as a truer self as a self we currently are as a self we can become either better or worse right now we are you know we can be a mix of good aspects and false aspects false and true aspects and we can either choose to become truer aspects of who we currently are or we can become falser aspects of who we are so that's two parts of how we're a double how we're the double of who we currently are and the double of the truer self, the higher self, which is how I was previously uh, describing soul and spirit and truth and morality and natural moral law and good and love as an absolute thing somewhere else and different layers of the things existing somewhere else. Now I understand the power of symbolism more. Now I'm explaining it more in a grounded reality in terms of ourselves. The moral spirit essence and nature that's the soul of man, the heart of man, the quintessence, the core of man, the essence of man, the spirit of man, the soul of man, uh, the truer self, the realer self, the higher self, the authentic self, etc., etc. I'm 
right now getting into the Egyptian symbolism as it relates to our Ka and the overall underlying principle of order, uh, truth, law, justice, everything good in creation as Ma'at and Ka Ma'at, Ka Ma'a, Ka Ma, Ka Ma, and Karma, they're all related. You can go look it up. Go look into the etymology for the word karma and how it can be written kama. And you look at the word ka and ma, well that's kama right there. It all comes from Egypt. All the symbolism is derived from Egypt and then it gets telephone line polluted, uh, degenerated and bastardized and anthropomorphized, personified and projected into literal forms over time and and it just becomes a ridiculous story narrative that people think is the literal truth and then they fight wars and kill and murder over stupid beliefs. Alright, so number 21, image 21, infographic 21 is uh, the Ka as uh, more explained in the dual aspects. So we've already been seeing the Ka tilted on the side and the good or evil, so the Ka is the spirit of the double truth. What double truth? The knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. The truth of what is good and the truth of what is evil. So good is synonymous with truth and evil is synonymous with falsity. But to know something is false is to know a truth about how it's false. To know how something is evil is to know a truth about how it's evil. So there's the truth of what's good and the truth of what's evil. These are the two ways. So the double truth and the hall of ma'at and the hall of ma'ati the hall of double truths, of double justice. Um, it's all about knowledge of good and evil, of the two ways to live, and the consequences that result thereof. So in the, the hall of Ma'adi and the judgment narratives and Osiris and all that, well, this, this is just creative imagery and symbolism to convey the meaning, and then it gets interpreted literally and used for rituals and controlling purposes by priestly castes. Anyways, so spirit of evil is the left hand, the negative, earth. On the right, you have air, the spirit of good, the right hand and positive. So on the left, you have repeating mistakes, wrong actions, not learning. There's entropy and stagnation, no history, nothing, frozen, death. So that's more imagery you can apply to other work I've done on entropy, stagnation, no history, nothing, frozen, and death. And on the right, well... That's progressing forward by not repeating mistakes. If you keep repeating mistakes, you're just going to keep digging a hole for yourself. But when you don't repeat the same mistakes and you learn, that's positive. You're going forward. That's syntropy. That's life. That's movement. That's history. And that's novelty. Because if you don't correct your mistakes, you just keep, keep creating the same thing over and over. That's not real history. That's not new things. That's doing the same old thing over and over and over in the progression of time which becomes history but it's not new things being done you're just doing the same old things over and over and hence look at the problem we're in and there's a dual aspect to the novelty as well the novelty is a good thing but it's also people have an infatuation with novelty and they're not looking at their current repeated mistakes the current ways of doing things the old ways, they're only looking at new ways and the new, all the new and the novelty they're in fashion. No, you need to look at your repeated mistakes, the wrong actions that keep you doing the same things and not learning, stagnating in a cycle, repeating the things over and over and over and over and over. That's entropy, that's stagnation, that's, you're gonna, you're gonna go to death. That's being frozen in time almost. Not literally, cause time is still progressing, but when you repeat the same mistakes, you're not progressing in history. You're not progressing in life. You're not moving forward. You're stuck behind. So again, um, our Ka, if we look at the elements here, we have our fire and desire up in the horizontal. I almost put two axes, but it would have been... I didn't want another axis here. So you can imagine an axis horizontal here, which would have been the vertical one in the other place, so earth to air, and horizontal in the other place, vertical here, from fire to water, so from our desires to our deeds, the positive or negative. Desires and deeds, positive or negative. The positive on the right to the air, or the negative on the left towards the earth. So not knowing good and evil is living in both. Dual, 
checkerboard. Due to that ignorance of the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, a chaotic existence is fed with the negative waters of tempest. So in a lot of symbolism you have tempests and then overcoming a tempest and the storm. Well, it's not just water in terms of just your deeds and actions. That's a tempest and storm in terms of the, de the negative deeds that you went through the negative side and the entropy and stagnation and creating chaos and isfet and negative into the world, the left-hand path. Well, when you go from those desires and you manifest in the deeds of that negative path, well, you're going to live in the negative waters of the tempest, the tempestuous negative waters. So our life goal is to reduce the negative existence to create in a positive higher existence, to seek truth through the knowledge of falsity and the negative. That's the knowledge of good and evil. You seek the negative. You seek the falsity, not in living, but in the knowledge of. To know that what's evil, there's so much more things that are acceptable than not acceptable. So you go the apophatic way to learn things that are not acceptable in order to know what is acceptable. Because currently everything that you do, everything that you do in your life, you view yourself as a moral and good person. So everything you do, even if it has evil in it, you're going to view it as good because you're only looking at the good. So in order to figure out what it is that you're doing that is evil and negative, you need to look at the negative and focus on the evil and negative and learn about it. Then you will be able to let go of your creation and your perpetuation of that evil into the world. You'll be able to abdicate from it and then you can create in good. But until you do that, until you gain knowledge of evil, well, everything you do is good and moral because you're a good and moral person. So there's nothing you need to change. That's why people need to speak truth into existence as a um, as a catalyst and pressure point, uh, just like heat. The heat, the light of truth. When you speak in your frequency of voice or a symbol, you create symbols and imageries and infographics, whatever. You create content for other people. You're speaking the light of truth, and that light of truth creates heat. Light, when it con comes into contact with another body, generates heat. Just like the light of the sun, the truth, reaching the earth, it makes contact with the earth and it generates heat. That's justice. So to set things right with justice, you need to speak truth into existence. The light of truth needs to make contact with someone else in order to generate heat. That's going to generate friction. The only reason there's there's a heat and a friction generated is because the the op, their opposites is because there isn't justice that there's going to be uh, injustice generated for the justice to combat for truth to battle falsity there needs to be falsity so the truth will battle the falsity the justice will battle the injustice because the light of truth has reached a source and made contact with that source of falsity in a lower frequency rate of vibration in the truth and frequency presentation uh, speak truth into existence presentation have it in red and the higher frequency in blue so when you speak you're gonna speak the, tr the light of truth make contact with someone in falsity they're living in falsity and, and the lack of truth you have truth and they have lack of truth they're living in darkness that's gonna generate heat of friction and conflict and controversy and tension and interference and that's how things get to change because if people are not looking at the knowledge of what is evil and how they are perpetuating evil then guess what they're just going to eternally believe that they are good they are moral and there's nothing about them that needs to change because as far as they're concerned living in the veil of evil as good in being blind to what evil really is, they're going to be creating evil as if it was good. Creating evil as if it was part of necessary life that they think is, is good as part of their way of living. So this is the real balance of ourselves with Ma'at, raising from the earth element towards the air on one axis. So here it's from left to right, from the earth to air, but previously it was from the bottom to the top one axis and we need to go from our desires to deeds 
from care to actions on the other axis. So, what hand do we act from? What hand do you act from? Are you going to choose the left hand or the right hand? And if you say you're choosing the right hand, how do you know you are choosing the right hand of good and the positive? Believing that you're positive, believing that you're good, believing that you're moral, that's not really being positive and, and righteousness of the right hand. That's being ignorant. If you go look at the pre-recent one I did uh, last week, presentation on truth, um, consciousness, reality, dualism, I forget. Truth, reality, and dualism or something. Anyways, there's four words. I forget what it's called. But uh, in there I explain this where you cannot simply have an optimism bias and positivity mask and think that everything's okay in the world, where your web of perception is that everything's good because you're not seeing reality as it accurately currently is, and therefore you're in an inability to properly and effectively take action in the state of reality in its current condition as it is. If you don't know the evil that currently is, there's no way you can stop the evil because you're not even aware that it's there and on top of that you think that it's good. Clearly you think that it's good if you view everything as good. We have infographic 22 next and the next 13 infographics should be fairly quick as I've gone through the core of the material already. This will just be additional symbolism, I think. So here we have um, wings and sun, air symbolism, and it relates to Ma'at. Now, a lot of depictions of Ma'at, you can tell Ma'at has the feather on her head. Um, the one on the, bottom, on the bottom right, that's not Ma'at. That is Isis or Nephthys, I think. I'm not sure. And the one on the bottom... Uh, bottom middle as well. That one I think is Isis as well. My point is, in the goddess symbolism, you will find wings because it's a feminine symbolism. Now, in sun symbolism, you will also find wings. Now, although sun symbolism is described as masculine, it is overall feminine because the birthing, rebirthing process is a feminine creator generative process. Now, I hope I've made this pretty clear so far in how the air symbolism is highly feminine as opposed to masculine and the chalice and the blade symbolism of the four elements and how the, the blade is always masculine, the chalice is feminine. Well, I'm telling you, air symbolism is highly feminine. So as I've already described with the importance of wings and bird symbolism and relating to uh, what's above in the air and the sky, well, that's where the sun is, and it all relates. This is all higher. So, you have some goddesses with wing symbolism that have directly the two horns, symbolic of Ka, in two ways, and the sun in between, symbolic of the higher. Or, you can look at it as, I guess more accurately, as the two witnesses, truth, and justice symbolized as being contained within the sun as the first and last truth and justice the first and the seventh of the spirits of good as being embodied through the symbol of the sun and especially when it's encapsulated by the, the dual horns to represent the, the two witnesses I view that more as representative of the overall archetype of higher symbolism of the feminine, the wings, the goddess, and the sun together with the two horns to view it as the two witnesses or the, the two truths of good and evil necessary to ascend. You can look at it in different ways. Again, this is symbolism. So there's also other areas where there's wing symbolism, and you have um, 
the sun disk with the wings, the dual wings. Again, you'll have dual wings and the dual horns. Sun symbolism with the dual snakes as well. The, there's the Uraeus symbol. And then you have the scarab symbol with the bird wings and uh, upholding the, the sun or reaching for the sun. It's always above the head. The sun is always above the head. It's on the head and between the horns, between the head. You'll have cow and bull symbolism whereby the horns on the head and the, the sun is placed in between the horns. That's why the horns are um, viewed as a, um, a power and rulership. Again, because of the ka. The ka, your two hands. The ka is um, power and strength as symbolized through the bull. Um, well, here I'm getting ahead of myself into the second part of the presentation on the ka and the bull and uh, Taurus and the Tau cross and the Ankh. But um, the ka, so what I didn't say about ka, which I'll be getting into the second presentation, is ka is symbolic of power and strength because ka is, is for two words in Egyptian. One is the... the the, the life force, the, the soul, the spirit part, whatever aspect of symbolism of ourselves. And then the other part that the word ka means is bull. Ka means bull. And ka means uh, spirit, power, strength, etc. So what is the spirit we're talking about? We're talking about the nature and the essence of spirit of our morality, that's the power, that's where we derive our power in reality. It's from our hands, our actions, and our deeds that act either in morality or in immorality. So the dual symbolism is all representative of that as I see it. So the ka, the two horns, the two arms, the two horns, is all the same thing. That's why the sun is in the middle, because it's about the power and strength we have to act in morality. Ka ma'at, ka ma. Karma, the, the strength and power of your arms and hands to reflect as the spirit, source, essence, and soul of who you are as your character as a person. Well, that's the goal towards that morality is through the symbolism of the sun and also in the rebirthing of the sun to renew ourselves, to rebirth ourselves, to remake ourselves into better versions of ourselves, which is also the, the uh, one aspect of the dark goddess symbolism. You know, there's the dark goddess symbolism of uh, fieriness and fierceness and Kalimat and the right eye of, of Ra or Horus and how that's uh, the right eye of uh, is, uh, is Tefnut herself or Ma'at herself or Isis herself etc. But it's the feminine and the fiery one. So you have that aspect of fieriness, but there's also the feminine aspect of uh, self-renewal and the vulture and death and the owl and, and such things where the, the dark side and Kalima is um, to put to death the evil. And that's why you need justice to put to death evil. So not only do you need to a self-renewal transformative process where you put to death things within yourself to become a better person. We also need to put to death, put an end to and stop the evil and the injustice in the world around us to act on behalf of good to stop evil. So there's a lot you can study in, in snake symbolism, in dual symbolism, the dual snakes, the dual wings, the dual horns, the sun and the, du uh, the dual hands of the ka, and the scarab beetle in the hands, and other hand symbolism, um, the sun symbolism between the two horns, between the two hands. Um, it's, all, it's all there. It's all about the same thing. Please go research it if you don't believe me. Uh, certainly do not accept what Egyptologists are telling you or other people are telling you. You have to look at the symbolism itself and understand what is being said through the symbolism. Understand it yourself. Don't read some guy who believes that Egyptologists, uh, some Egyptologist or whatever interpreter that believes that, oh, the Egyptians were all obsessed with the afterlife and it was all about the afterlife. Yeah, that was the exoteric narrative to control people. Get them focused on the afterlife so that they'll do whatever you want them to do 
in this life. They'll do your rituals, they'll do your whatever, and they'll keep you in power because they believe in this bullshit belief that you fed them. Hence, religion since the beginning, at least post Ice Age, it's always been negative. From all the evidence we have, all these beliefs have been used to manipulate people. Whenever they get set up into a structured society where there's authority and rulership, oh yeah, definitely. It's all get being used against you. So, on the bottom right, I have um, this image I found when I was looking for the Ankh, and again, Ankh cross, the Ru part, the oval, um, going upwards towards the scarab beetle with holding the sun and the wings and all that symbolism again in the life, in the real life. On the left, you have Nefer Kama'at, which is the goddess Kama'at. So again, here, Kama'at. Why Kama'at? It has to do with karma. This is the only place I've, I've seen referencing Kama'at, apart from the book Finishing the Mysteries of uh, Gods and Symbols, Volume 0. And here we have Heru Jedin Ma'at Aten Ra. And that's Horus, Heru's Horus, and Ma'at, and then Aten Ra is uh, Atom, Ra Atom, and, and, and the evening. And then Heru, Horus is both um, the morning and the evening, the two horizons. So I don't know what the name means, I'm just uh, describing some aspects of what I learned. Like I said, I don't know everything about the symbolism of Egypt and what everyone says about it. I went to look at what other people had to say about certain specific parts that I tried to correspond and understand how Ka Ma'at is really karma, and I understand it. Because you look at the symbolism itself, not what the Egyptologists are telling you, that they understand from their limited lower consciousness, lack of understanding all of this ancient wisdom and alchemy. They don't understand that, but they think they can interpret the real meaning of these narratives are. Only few. And right beside that one I just described, there's a, a picture I found of different uh, religions. So at the top, I think that's Egyptian. The second one is uh, Zoroaster. Third one, I don't know. Maybe um, one of them's from Sumer. And the bottom one is um, the, the sun disk wing symbolism from uh, Mayan, Toltec, Olmec, Aztec, whatever, Ek, part of Mesoamerica. Alright, so that's that symbolism. Now we'll go on to infographic number 23. So here I have some causality and time cycle symbolism. So there's the importance of cause and effect and how it keeps going. Um, I would not be where I am without those who came before me. And hopefully I'm influencing those other people to understand other things and continue with other work based on some understandings that I'm expressing. And then on and on it goes and everyone that comes before us plays a part in where we are now, good or bad. It's just it's where we are based on where we have been. All right, so we have Ouroboros, infinity, cause and effect symbolism. So everyone knows the Ouroboros snake. Well, I just did it in a very plain way with an arrow and a, a beginning of an arrow. So this is symbolic of the wheel of time, the wheel of fortune, the wheel of destiny, the wheel of fate, the wheel of dharma, the wheel of karma. It's all in the Ouroboros, infinity. It's the same thing. Talk, we're all talking about the same thing. as coming back on ourselves as a cause and effect. It's a prime ratio of reality, one to one, which equals one. One to one, one over one equals one. It's one. It's the, a, a deep foundation, along with logic. So we have the snake eating its own tail, or that it's regurgitating its tail and producing. Uh, existence and then we get back to its the head and then the head regurgitates its tail again or it's um, you know the the head is eating the tail it eats itself and then it keeps eating itself or regurgitating itself however you want to look at it whatever tons of Ouroboros symbolism 
I'm just tying this into here. And we also have a spiral or a fractal, uh, recursiveness, and infinite cause and effect, where we have cause and effect, and then back to cause and effect, and cause and effect down and down and down into the infinite fractal spiral loop it goes. Forever and ever and ever, this cause and effect, cause and effect, interconnecting. And I've talked about recursive looping aspects in, in programming. I believe that was in... I think it's causality and consciousness part one. If not, it's part two. Yeah. Um, here we have, uh, you know, we look at it as the Kedushi staff. Right beside that one, the Kedushi staff of Hermes, which again is Thoth. Hermes, Thoth, Thoth, Ma'at, wisdom, Ma'at, truth. Also, and we have Ma'at and karma, Ka Ma'at. Kama'at, Ka and Heka, employing the Ka or activating the Ka, Heka, eternity of Ka, uh, eternal Ka. Um, the the symbol for Heka is the Kedusha staff, but without the staff. It's just the the DNA spiral, and it's the opposite way, as I have it here. Um, the open end is on the bottom, and the closed end is on the top for the uh, He symbol which means uh, a million years or a hundred million years, which for the Egyptians symbolized eternity, at least in our interpretations of their work. So here we have the Kedusha staff, Hermes tied to Thoth, Thoth to Ma'at, Ma'at to Ka Ma'at, Karma, and Ka Ma'at to Ka, and Ka to Heka. So we have the Hermes right to He, the god, uh, personified of Heka employing and activating the Ka. Um, above, we have the eight spoke wheel of time and fortune. So we have the eight spoke wheel with the, the wheel and the eight spokes around it. This is how the wheel of Dharma is represented. Um, this is how the wheel in the tarot is represented. I don't have enough room to add that. Maybe I do. So the Wheel of Fortune has eight spokes, and again it has the four elements, and it has the the Sphinx and holding the, the, the sword, and then you go down with the snake, and then up with Anubis, and that's symbolic of the underworld, and rebirthing, and rejuvenation, etc., etc., and the four elements, again, the quaternity, and the... and again it's in the right order. You have... Um, fire. So if you start from the bottom bottom left and go counterclockwise just as the snake and Anubis is going, it's all going counterclockwise. The wheel goes counterclockwise in terms of the order. Because you're rising up the, the way Anubis is rising up on the on the right side, that's the way it goes. Even though tarot is written from left to right, it's it's uh from right to left for T, then to the right to A R O from right to left. It goes from left to right. As an, as the snake goes down and Anubis going up, that's the order. As we can see the lion on the bottom right, and you go to the to the top, to the eagle, then to the water, then to the bull, back to the lion, to the eagle. So fire, air, water, earth. Fire, air, water, earth. Those who have the symbolism properly described have it properly described. And then there's many places, such as astrology, where it's incorrectly described, where it doesn't reflect reality, and it doesn't reflect truth accurately. So, the eight-spoke wheel of time and fortune. Again, time. We're going to get... Um, we have eight, the eight-spoke wheel. Eight. As I've mentioned before, time, symbolized by the infinity sign, right? Looks like an eight. Well, the eight-spoke wheel, the wheel of time, the wheel of fortune, the wheel of fate, the wheel of destiny, the wheel of dharma, it all has to do with time, symbolized by eight spokes, eight positions. Um, you can see that in the zodiac in terms of the four main elements and the, the two solstices and the two equinox, that creates four arms as well. But in, uh, in the spoked wheel you can have four or eight. 
So when you have 8, it really does demonstrate time because you have... Um, have I shown that yet? No, I haven't. I have work that I haven't shown yet in terms of uh, the layers. The first seven dimensions, and then the eighth dimension is time. And then you have dimension 1, 2, and 3 for space, which would be 9, 10, and 11. So the eighth one is time. And here we go. The eighth, the eight symbol of infinity, infinity symbol of time. You have below that the hourglass. The hourglass is a symbol of time. Eight is a symbol of time through infinity symbol. Hourglass is a symbol of time. Eight spokes is a symbol of time. Um, so we have the x, which is x times, you know, in math, 4 times 2 is 8. So even in the, in the symbol, you have, as I mentioned earlier, in the, the earlier part of this presentation, you have the two lines. They have the sun symbol with the dot, right? And then you have the two lines on the side. That's the sun symbol. You can go look it up. Now, I refer to this as the two witnesses of the two. But in, when I was describing that earlier symbolism, when you cross the two lines together, you get a 4 from the 2. You have four parts with a fifth point in the middle. So, when you get the 4 from the 2, well, 2 times 4, that makes 8. So, what, you, what happens when you, you get 4 from 2 is you get the cross. This x in the cross way. And this x means times in math. And if you do... The 4 from the 2, if you take those two numbers, the 4 and 2, they produce 8, which equals times again. So this is just symbolic, numerology, whatever. It just, maybe it just happens to fit or whatever. Or maybe the, the way people derive the symbols, again, they actually knew what they were doing, and it reflected reality correctly. So, from the 2, you get the 4. You take 2 times 4, you get the 8. So in the spoke wheel four elements, or you can have the eight-spoke wheel. So the eight, the hourglass infinity, if you take the X and you put two lines on it, well, it looks like what's below the X, which is a, an infinity symbol, right? So if you take your X and you put two lines and you cut it off, uh, you close it off on two points, you get the infinity symbol. And if you turn that on uh, 90 degrees, well, you get the hourglass symbol, and it's also the feminine body symbol of two triangles joined together. And you can go look at, look this up as well. This is the, the feminine body shape. The shape of two inverted triangles, the chalice and the blade joined together at their point. This is the feminine body shape. Go look it up if you don't believe me. So it's the feminine body shape. It's time. It's times as an X. The x has is uh, from 2 to create 4. The 2 and the 4 create 8. 8 back to time again, an infinity symbol. So we're all talking about cause and effect. And uh, when we deal with consciousness and existence, how we as consciousness, the power of consciousness, to affect the primacy of existence. Infographic number 24. Here we have um, more aspects of causality, tying it to the cross and the cost. So we have cause and effect, the cross. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, the two lines. So cause and effect, again, with the symbolism of the uh, infinity, which I've gone into in consciousness and causality part two. So this relates to the number 11. You have two lines that cross. And then you put two more lines on the end, and that makes the infinity symbol of cause and effect reciprocal. And if, so if you look at infinity, you know, that's the, as I just described with the X with the two lines. So that's a one and a one, and they cross over and they add the symbolism. But originally the one and the one, together as the two truths, as the two witnesses, well that just makes 11, the number 11. So when you look at tarot, and you're looking at cause and effect, we're talking about morality and we're talking about two things, right? The ka, the two arms. We're talking about uh, our actions, we're talking about two ways, the cross of two ways, or four elements, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which leads to justice, and we're talking about truth and light, and uh, justice is heat, and ignorance is injustice everywhere, hence evil. Well, look at the 11 and look at the tarot. Well, the tarot is justice. 
card 11. It just happens to, f to fit. <coughs> you could also tie this to tarot card 8, which I believe are interchangeable in some systems. Um, some different representations where justice is 8 and strength is 11. So if you have the infinity symbol as the 8 and that's strength, or you could have it as justice, I guess that's maybe that's why they're interchangeable because 8 and 11 are linked symbolically in the way that I've just described. It's a possibility. I don't know. I didn't invent the tarot. I don't know where they chose to use the symbolism, and I didn't invent the number system, and I didn't invent a bunch of things. But all I can do is see what I see. So the ka, the two paths, the two ways. We have the, the wrong, false and evil, and the truth, right and good. And when you cross the two ways, well, that's bearing your own cross as well. That's symbolism where you're going to choose upon yourself to carry your own cross of the four elemental pathway to create in reality, as well as carry the knowledge of good and evil yourself, and not expect other people to uh, carry the burden of knowing good and evil. But you have to know the two paths, the two ways, the two truths, the double truth of good and evil, and you have to carry that cross yourself to bear your own cross, both in the knowledge of good and evil and, as I've earlier described, as the four elemental quaternity process of generating in reality. There's two, two aspects of bearing your own cross, generating in reality responsibly, and the knowledge that's symbolized by the two cross, the two ways, the two paths, the two cause, which is our the source of our power and strength. The power and strength to generate in evil or in good. Image number 25. This has some more uh, ma'at symbolism in terms of truth and justice. As ma'at, as shown with uh, the feather of truth. But she's also the guardian of the duat in the halls of Ma'ati, where your heart, your mind, consciousness, thoughts, desires, cares, deeds, actions, were weighed against the feather of truth itself. And if your, if your heart weighed, was weighed down by evil, compared to the light of truth and the lightness of the feather, your heart would weigh down, and the, the beast composed of hippopotamus, leopard, and crocodile, um, Kamat, Kamit, I forget the name, it's in my notes somewhere, it would devour your heart, which is symbolic of putting, so since your heart failed to measure up to truth, you have falsity in you. So what happens? Well, the beast devours you. Yeah, that's what you got to do. you got to devour and put to death, shatter and dissolve the falsity within you in order to reach higher planes of consciousness, of existence, in this reality. It's all up to us. you got to do it yourself, though, too. So when you... This is all symbolic. The, the, the judgment against the feather of Ma'at, and you have the baboon of, uh, of Thoth above, and then you have... Uh, a symbolic of the fulcrum, or you'd have sometimes ma'at at the fulcrum of the, the balance, and you also have Thoth over there with his ibis head recording everything, and uh, you have Amit, again the hippo bottom, the leopard top, and the crocodile head. If your heart was not measuring up to truth, if you still had falsity in you and darkness and evil, well then you put it to death, put to death that which is evil, false, your shadow, your negative, your demon, and transform yourself, renew yourself, evolve yourself into a better version of yourself. This doesn't happen literally at death, and if you want to believe that, then you believe in bullshit. That's the whole problem of all these beliefs. People just believe the exoteric narratives. Oh, look at what happens after you die. Oh, yeah. Well, we got, uh, you got your ba there, and your car, your car's got to be fed with food. Oh, and then there's your ba. There's the eagle with the human head there. That's the ba, pretty sure. So your ba is there, which, as I've decoded, is representative of your true self. So your ba is there, the true self, 
waiting to see if you can become a true self, you know. Ah, oh, but this is all literal, and there's all these gods, and then all oh, you're going to be eaten, your heart's going to be eaten by the the Kamat, I forget what the, the name of the monster is, but uh, people had fear, you know. If, if you didn't go into eternal life, then you were just into annihilation, you were annihilated. So everyone wanted to get into eternal life, they didn't want to be annihilated from existence. So, you know, you had to feed your Ka, this, this life force, soul, spirit, whatever, belief, exoteric belief. So you had to feed that so that it didn't die while you awaited uh, the process of judgment. And then uh, if you were worthy, if you measured up to Ma'at and the lightness of the feather of truth, then Osiris granted you access to uh, the land of reeds, the eternal paradise, and heaven, blah, 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 etc. Now people believe this is literal. Why? Because they don't understand alchemy. They don't understand processes of self-transformation. They don't understand symbolism properly. And they believe it's all literal. Go through Egypt, go through Sumer, go through anywhere in the past, and go through the narratives and take them all as literal, and tell me how much knowledge about life you're actually going to derive. It's going to be very minimal. But when you actually understand symbolism, and you understand ancient, deep, symbolic wisdom, valuable knowledge about morality and truth, then you can begin to uncode, uh, decode, the deeper wisdom in these cultures. Or at least understand um, later derivations and the deification and anthropomorphizing, personification, and projection of ourselves onto other symbols to express aspects of ourselves. At least you can understand that. Coupled with you know deeper aspects of knowledge of ourselves, then you can understand what the symbolism really means and how they're just uh, they have storm gods and air gods and you know all these other gods and that's to represent aspects of uh, of nature or aspects of ourselves and we're just deifying it. It's not that there's literal gods. Like give me a break. So this image is just Maat, who's equated to Themis, who's also equated to Dyke, and also to Metis which means wisdom. So uh, the the blinded chick with the sword and the balance, you know, sword of truth, lady justice, that's all aspects of um, the Greek or Roman, uh, I think they're both Greek. No, one would be Greek and one would be Roman. I don't know. Um, I think Themis is one with the sword down and Dyke with the sword up. I don't remember. Anyways, it's all aspects that derive from earlier symbolism from Ma'at. Now, you have Themis, which has a scale and blinded and a, and a sword. And you have Dyke, which had the same symbolism. But then there's Metis, which was a personification of absolute wisdom. Which is what Thoth represents, who is the counterpart both to Seshat, which is uh, wife's uh, spouse of Thoth in one uh, narrative, and represents wisdom along with Thoth. But Thoth also um, the husband to Ma'at, the, the personification of truth, justice, order, everything. The source of all wisdom is the feminine. So the, the Metis was the personification of wisdom again as a feminine. That's why you have uh, Sophia, uh, Philosophia, um, Mary Magdalene, Sophia, uh, many, many uh, female names, feminine names as personifications of wisdom because it's a feminine component that's why you have in the book of revelations the seven pillars of wisdom there's a lot of seven associated with wisdom as well wisdom is uh anyways it's it's a feminine symbol feminine usually you know in thoth it was masculine but in greek it became wisdom and in sophia wisdom uh, through Metis and all through Mat and Justice as well. Again, feminine through Dyke and Themis coming from Maat originally. Um, the Justice card appears to be a man in uh, Justice, uh, the Tarot card 11. So maybe it's a man, maybe it's a woman. Looks like a man to me. Maybe it's a woman. I don't know. It would have made sense if they would have made it a woman, because everywhere else it's been a woman. It's been a, it's a woman as Dyke. It's a woman as 
Themis, and it's a woman as Ma'at. Again, personifications of feminine aspects of symbolism and consciousness. It's all about justice. So I don't know why the tarot has it as a man, but whatever. It doesn't really matter. As long as you understand that it represents more of a feminine personification as the symbolism was derived and its source meaning. So if it's a man, whatever, just like Thoth, wisdom. Thoth, wisdom is more of a feminine quality, Sophia. Uh, all and other names, I can't think of any others other than Sophia. But there's others. Um, and then Metis and Ma'at, wisdom that's personified through that. But then it gets through Thoth as a masculine component. And as I've said before, the, the post-flood, post-Diluvian, post-Ice Age, Creator God was masculine, you know. The, the primordial chaos waters, that was masculine. Everything was masculine. All the central parts were masculine because it was all male dominator power. Alright, so infographic number 26. This is um, explaining more the uh, Ma'at, Truth, and Justice as uh, the scales and weighing. It's uh, Ma'at and Truth and Justice as the guidelines. Is Ma'at at the center for judging and weighing, or you could have the baboon of Thoth or the iconograph for the Ma'at goddess at that fulcrum point being the guidelines and judging and weighing everything. It's the, the fulcrum of balance, the, the, the balance principle. That's why Ma'at is balance and order, equilibrium. Even the word for, uh, I have it in one of my write ups I did. Ma'at is, Ma'a is M, and then the, the glyph, for, it, looks, it looks like a 3, so M3, and then there's M3 apostrophe T, and that's Ma'at, and then you have um, the word for scale, has, uh, has 3 apostrophe T, or M3 apostrophe, or somewhere in, in the word for scale itself, has the has a component of ma'at in the word for scale itself because it has to do with balance and order and justice. Because within their own word, the Egyptian word for scale contains a, a root from, from ma'at or ma'a. So on the left side we have, um, so here we're trying to, we're weighing, judging and testing ourselves, the heart compared to the feather of truth. The heart is our desires, cares, inclinations, actions and deeds compared to uh, the feather of truth, which is light, which is truth. So, we determine the essence of our ka, our spirit. Evil weighs down your spirit. Ka actions, the spirit in which we do things of good or evil. So, evil weighs you down, your spirit, and your ka and your actions, the spirit in which we do things of good or evil, the evil weighs that down. So that's why you fall below, and you're going to fall towards the ground because the feather of truth is lighter than your corrupted desires, cares, inclinations, actions, and deeds. So you fall down and then the, the beast can devour your heart as it's supposed to. But people were taught, at least were, were, were uh, people transliterate this, that uh, the people were taught to fear, um, going against the, the 42 negative confessions because if you didn't measure up to the feather of truth and lightness, well then you'd go into annihilation. So all this fear of death and fear of not existing was brought in to control and manipulate people through beliefs in order to get them to adhere to rituals and uh, customs and ways of living. Even if they were moral, that's not the point. The point is they use the lie to control people, which is the model for religion forever. Not through objective knowledge, but through fear. Fear of God, fear of X, Y, Z. You put the fear in people and then they'll do what you say. So they, they fear getting their heart devoured and going into annihilation. And the only way to avoid that was to live up to the 42 negative confessions of Ma'at. So you would be in line, in alignment with the feather of truth, in the same lightness of truth. And then you would get to go, uh, or Osiris would grant you access to um, the land of the reeds. Yay! What a magical story. I better do what the priests tell me. Better do what the Pharaoh tells me. Boy, oh boy, I don't want to have my heart devoured and end up in uh, 
non-existence and be annihilated. Boy, I fear that too much. I want to keep living forever. I want to be immortal. <laughs> See what I've been talking about over and over and over in the fear and the uncertainty and the doubt and the insecurity and how providing answers alleviates that. I've been talking about it for many, many podcasts, uh, audios or whatever, presentations, the past five, ten. I'm going to keep talking about it because people really need to understand this negative aspect of belief. And how powerful belief is and how it can really, really screw us up. Like, tremendously mess us up. And we think everything's fine. And, oh yeah, it's all good. Positivity bias, optimism, mask, and just veiling evil under good. So, the cause spirit is the character nature and essence accumulated from our deeds and our actions of our lifetime. Spirit equals moral essence, the ka of life or good, or the ka of death and evil. So, the death of mind and heart in earth low consciousness, to be dead in mind and heart in low earth low consciousness, and living. The living are in the mind and heart in high air consciousness. So karma and kama, kama at, is the ma'at of our ka, which is our spirit. So our ka spirit living in ma'at. That's what it's all about. That's it, that's all. Karma, kama, ka ma'a, ka ma'at, is the ma'at of our ka, the truth and justice, and law, and order, and balance of our spirit. The spirit is the ka. The spirit, the essence, and nature, our character, is our ka, symbolized by our hands and deeds, hands and arms, which produce our actions and deeds, which is our spirit, our character, our, nas our nature, our essence. That's who we become. That's who we are. If you want more information on uh, etymology, on character, uh, really good. It's three hours though, or two hours, but it's really good and informative. I was I I was impressed by the work I had done in that pre in that uh, audio. So I was reading my etymological breakdown of characters and our character, and how this is all related to morality and who we are as the heart of man, the true, the core of man, etc. So um, in the heart symbolism, I just have a note here. So since before I've said, heart is viewed as the fountain of man's deeds, the driving motivational source of desire and willpower, and the heart is inside of our body. So symbolically, they used the heart symbol as the center of our body, as the center of our being, as the core of our self. The, because the heart of the tree is the core, you have the heart of the subject, which is the center core, the important, the essential, the nature, matter, uh, mater, the mother of the subject. And you have the heart of darkness, which is the inner depth, the deepest part, etc. And you have the heart of man. Man's heart is the center of being, the quote spirit, not the physical heart, which is the confusion people get into. The quote spirit of man and the quote heart of man is the quintessence, the true self, in true care, striving for truth and morality. It's the spirit in which we do things. Uh, the spirit in which we do things is the care, desire, motivation, etc., that produces, um, that is a reflection of the spirit of man, the heart of man, um, the, the heart of our nature, the heart of our essence, the essence of man, the nature of man, the character of man, etc., the morality of our essence, etc., um, the spirit in which we do things, the care and desire, the inclinations that lead to our deeds and our actions, which will de determine the spirit of who we are. There's the spirit in which we do things, and then the spirit of who we are with what we actually do. Our character, our nature, our essence. So you can go look at uh, that previous presentation, highly recommended. Characters and our character. Audio and YouTube video. Well, there's nothing in the video. It's just on YouTube as an audio. So we have our future rewards and consequences based on past actions. That is to say, truth or consequence. As I've been talking about what karma really is. Oh, you want to you say, oh, oh, this bad thing happened oh, because of my bad karma. Oh, oh ha, ha, 
you bad thing happened to you because ha ha you're bad karma. Oh, and then we go back to the caste system. Oh, well, you're in, you're being raped because you were a bad person, or oh, I chopped your leg off because you were a bad person in your past life. It's all bullshit. Karma has to do with past actions which create future rewards and consequences. So this is true balance, a scale, a comparison to bring us into balance with natural moral law, truth and justice. So one drop of evil weighs down our existence with dire results. I've mentioned this before, um, either in Speak Truth into Existence or the other one on truth, reality and realism, uh, dualism. The importance of the negative and how it overrides the good. The importance of good and evil is really important, well, along with psychology and attachment. Let go of yourself and face the evil, face the shadow, demon, darkness, evil, negative, wrong, and immorality within you that's weighing you down when you think that you're, you're just good and, good and moral and perfect. You don't think anything's weighing you down because you think you're good and moral. There's nothing you need to change, nothing you need to learn about yourself that can help the world and make things better. No, no, no. It's always other people. So the goal, again, is freedom from evil and the negative results we create, not false balance accommodation with evil, which is how all the channeled entities, all the bullshitters, all the new age bullshitters, Oh, it's all life, oh, good and evil. Yo, you're stuck in dualism. You're talking about things and good and evil and right and wrong. Oh, you're dualistic. Oh, I'm, I'm so evolved. I'm in the zero point and I'm just enjoying my experience and la la la, rosy colored glasses and la la fantasy bullshit land. Because they just want to accommodate evil. They just want to accept evil. Oh, it's just part of experience. We need the evil. It's part of good. La la la. I'm so full of shit and I'm so retarded in devolved consciousness, but I think I'm so evolved with my new age bullshittery. Well, keep, keep your attachment to yourself and to your psychological insecurities and net, don't learn about psychology and attachment. Don't learn about greater aspects of truth. Keep yourself attached to that pseudo-spiritual Eastern and new age bullshit. Yeah, have fun with that. So we got infographic number 27. So here I'm tying into the Ka and the Sun. I've already mentioned the, the, the Dejed pillar with the Ankh and the arms holding up the Sun. So here you can actually see it. So the world of man needs to create in, quote, spirituality, in morality, to reach up to the world of truth, of Ma'at the conceptual underlying foundational order of creation. So again, when you look at earth and air, well, you got to reach from, you got to go from the earth to the air, the air, sky, heavens, etc. To create a heaven and a paradise on earth, well, you got to reach that yourself in consciousness, and then you can manifest it externally. So we, we reach it with the power of Ka, the power of strength of our Ka, our actions and our deeds, activating the Ka in Heka, which is the personification of uh, employing the car, activating the car, which I have here over to the side. Remember that uh, DNA spiral loop symbol for he and then ka. So he ka, that means employ the ka, activate the ka. So activating the ka and he ka to reach up to ma'at and higher order consciousness. So we look at the dejed pillar. So I'm saying we need the foundation, we need to create ourselves in the world in the mat in the conceptual underlying foundational order of creation the Dejed pillar, the order from earth going up to the air. On top of that, the Ankh cross, the Ankh, the air, the life, air, the breath of life, what gives life, Shu, air, life, the arms of the Ka, again, the power, the strength to reach that life, to reach that truer self, the sun, the life, the light of truth, all that symbolism, all going upwards, to higher consciousness, to reach up to higher consciousness, activating our Ka to reach that higher consciousness. So the pillars and columns symbolize the building up from the earth to the air, sky and heavens to reach ma'at, truth, law, justice, order, etc. So in the middle infographic, this is, uh, I found it somewhere, 
Um, this also has the two-line symbolism, which is very powerful. Um, Shu and Tefnut were symbolized as two lions. Tefnut is the, the central lioness. Shu is sometimes described as a lion. The, the Shu and Tefnut. Tefnut was also described as a male counterpart, starting with uh, an A. I forget his name. R. Dark or whatever. Um, so Shu. Tefnut was made masculine. Shu and Tefnut were seen as two lions. Um, but originally it's uh, Tefnut as the lioness. There's the two lioness. Uh, guards and many symbols and uh, sculptures in Egypt. And this has to do with um, Herak II, or I forget the word, but it has to do with Horus of the Two Horizons. Um, so that's what the, the two lions and the two eyes of Ra and Shu and Tefnut and the two horizons and it has to do with sunrise and sunset. It has to do with rejuvenation, with redoing ourselves, remaking ourselves, renewal, etc., etc. It's all sun symbolism. So here we have the pillar of Jed, the pillar of Osiris. And I'll just mention that before part two. The Jed pillar, the, the Waz staff, the Uaz staff, and the Ankh, which are three symbols that are highly associated with each other. Here we only have two. We have the pillar and the Ankh, um, but then we have the Ka as a third symbol. Um, in the third image here, so we only have the Jed, but the, the, the Jed, the Ka, uh, sorry, the Jed, the Ankh, and the Uwas, or Was, Scepter, are all aspects of bull symbolism. Uh, bull body parts that were used as symbolism um, to describe aspects of ourselves and reality, which is what I'm talking about, which is what the whole point of symbolism is and why they're, invent why they're derived in the first place. This will be in part two more, though. just wanted to mention it. So, this image I found of the Zodiac has things properly positioned. It has Taurus at the bottom. Earth, so the pillar, Earth, going from the bottom up to the top. What's at the top? Well, we have Scorpio, but as we all know, that's supposed to be Achilles, the eagle. And what do we have at the right? Well, we have Leo. What do we have at the left? We have uh, Aquarius, the water bearer. So this one actually has the zodiac in the proper position in terms of how we create in reality, and it even has the, the Jed pillar symbolizing going from that lower earthly nature to the higher uh, air nature and it even has as uh, the symbolism I've been describing in infographic 1 to 4 uh, and 5 and 6 with uh, the raw wheel well you have the two Horuses of the horizon the two lionesses again um, symbolic of the sunrise and the sunset the Horus that's rising and the Horus that's setting now also In the symbolism, you have water that's pouring down, right? Pouring down. The eagle's in the air. The man's pouring water from the jug onto the earth. The bull runs in the earth. The lion also runs in the earth, but the lion leaps. Leaps and attacks and charges. And this is also other symbolism that you can find elsewhere, where the two lions, one is seeing as, um, as crouching and kneeling, and uh, has the sun, or the, even the earth, uh, on its uh, on its back, holding it up, and the other one is lunging upwards. So one is one has the responsibility of of uh, bearing the weight in some capacity symbolically, and then the other one has a responsibility of rising up. One has the responsibility of going down. One's going up. Anyways, that's later on as well. Well, if I ever put those notes out into an edited text format. You can go research yourself. So on the right side I have Shu holding up Nut, which I've already described, and Geb on the bottom, the masculine on the bottom, feminine on top, and you see the, the solar bark riding uh, Nut, um, or the sun going through Nut. I'll have another infographic on that later. So on the bottom one here we have Shu with the sun on his head, and he's holding up Nut, and he has two Anks in his arms, because Shu again was life. What is Ank? Ank is life. Shu was air, air is life. It's all the same symbolism. We have the sun involved, and it's all about um, the trek um, at night from death to a rebirth in the morning. Uh, I also have the Heka, employ the Ka, with the two symbols, He and Ka. And then we have the actual statue for Heka, which is a person with the Ka on their head. So what have we been talking about? Pa 
as uh, the ka as the power and the strength for uh, as also symbolized as a double and a uh, as a spirit and soul. So if you have you here as a body, and then you have your your ka on top of your head as your power, well that's right, because that's all the symbolism again on top of heads and holding um, the sun above your head and above your head and in your hands. And it's all upwards. Well, that's all higher consciousness. Uh, up in the air, in the sky, in the heavens, in the air. So, in, in when you have things on top of your head, that's why a lot of the, the horns on the head, and a lot of other cultures as well, have horned symbolism, the Vikings, uh, Sumerians, etc. Even some of them have feathers and horns on top of their heads. And when you look at Amun-Ra, and um, he has a feathered headdress, and Shu is the feather, uh, the word for feather, and you have... Um, the, the feather of truth, the ma'at feather, the symbol for feather is called ma'at, which represents ma'at, and uh, all that's related. And uh, Amun Ra has seven feathers in each row, and he has four rows of seven. Four rows of seven, if you add them up, seven and four, well, that's eleven, the eleven dimensions. Again, the four dimensions above of three space and one time, time at the eighth and the seven below, the seven dimensions. That's just, there's just symbolism in his headdress of how they maybe understood or had knowledge of dimensional understanding. I don't know, maybe it's all invented. Maybe there is no eleven dimensions. I don't know. I'm just bringing symbolism forward. So I'm showing um, Shu with his hands holding up Nut, separating the earth from the sky. I can see symbolically um, you know, good from evil, whatever. It relates to the Ka, holding the arms. How Shu of the air, of life, and breath, and the Ankh relate. And that relates to the sun, and the sun symbolism with the horns on top of the heads of, of deities, as well as the Ka on top of the head of this dear, uh, I guess this is a pharaoh because he has a beard. I don't think gods had beards. So, this was, um, I'm pretty sure it's a statue of Heka. Or it could just be someone with their activated Ka as a pharaoh. Anyways, it's to show the importance of the Ka. As again, this, this um, headdress symbolism that had, uh, it can be likened to the, the two horns and the sun in the middle, and that it's related to the horns, obviously, because of the bull, which was Ka, and this symbol was also Ka, and they both symbolized strength and power. So, the power of your consciousness can also be seen as the Ka, so you have your lower self as a body, and then you have your Ka from your consciousness, which can bring you to do things, act and behave in the world, and become a new version of yourself. So there's another aspect of the double if you want to look at it. So I'll just continue reading. He, from Heka, means eternity as well, and this is what we reach as well, the the diet, not diet, but diet, eternity, of afterlife, immortality, heaven and paradise of living in morality, in ma'at. Ma'at is the foundation as the pillar becomes. Hmm. Oh, ma'at is the foundation, the original conceptual foundation, as the pillar becomes. So the Dejed pillar is also symbolized as a foundation, going from the earth, reaching up higher into the heavens, into the sky, into the air, where the sun is, and um, the Ankh is, and the Shu is, and the Shu has the Ka, his, his Ka is holding up Nut and the sky and the heavens, and creating the, the order of, uh, of the universe and creation and earth. So this is why symbolism is all, it's largely interconnecting and interrelating, it changes, um, depending on context, you can interpret it in different ways, but when you're looking at it all together, it has a certain um, central meme, and that is of reaching for truth, good, right, morality. So again, we have our ka to reach for that, and what are we reaching? We're reaching for ma'at, which is symbolized by that, and the sun also. And the sun process of rebirthing and re 
uh, resurrecting and reviving ourselves in that process from a former self to a new self. And that's what uh, the Heka employing the Ka, because then when we employ the Ka properly and good and create a good on earth, well, that's the symbolism for the afterlife and immortality and eternity and heaven and paradise of living in morality on earth. That's what the goal is. So like, like, like Ankh, uh, wait a second, I mean life, life, Ankh, was about living in Ma'at as good, which is the word Nefer, N-F-R, you see Nefer any, anywhere, N-F-R anywhere, well that just means good or beauty, which was, uh, I guess it depends on the context, but pretty much the same thing. And this is where Plato got his ideas from. I'm pretty much guaranteed that Solon and uh, you got uh, Pythagoras and many other people going to Egypt and Moses and many other wisdom teachers and they are they seem to be all coming out of Egypt learning what they're learning. But yet when we go to Egypt, all the Egyptologists, all this knowledge, this ancient wisdom. Oh, well, it's nowhere. <laughs> because they don't know how to read the symbols, and the symbols are themselves limited to what the symbols themselves were expressing in terms also of controlling the populace as exoteric narratives. So it's not like you could explicitly state everything or even implicitly symbolize esoterically the aspects of wisdom that you're trying to convey through the exoteric narrative. So anyways, the good, the beauty from Plato, that's where he got his stuff from, the Nefer. So life, Ankh, was about living in Ma'at as good, in Nefer, as a divine being, as a good divine being. As I showed in the previous uh, infographic, where there was Ma'at and, uh, and Heru, uh, Horus, and it was uh, Nefer, Ka Ma'at. So it was the good of the Ka in Ma'at. It's all related. So as um, life Ankh was about living in Ma'at as good Nefer, divine being to be immortal as Osiris. So you needed to, to be a divine being, to be a true living, as I've mentioned. You had the power of the divine Ka, the, ga, the Ka of the gods, which only the Pharaoh had originally. And that made you a living. And it made you eligible for the afterlife. But everyone else wasn't. Because they weren't a living. Because they didn't have this divinity in them. This divine Ka. Only the Pharaoh had it. And could uphold living in truth and justice of Ma'at. But it's all social engineering belief systems to indoctrinate and manipulate. Control a populace. So Osiris was the immortal. And you can become immortal as Osiris by weighing your heart against truth and then passing the test of putting to death the falsity. And you, you do this, it's not literally after death, it's when you choose to put to death things within you, you go through this process of judgment where you compare yourself to truth and you put to death the falsity within you so that you can remake yourself anew anew. And that's why coming out of the underworld... Um, Amun Ra, the midnight phase of Ra, well, that's where you reach um, Keper, Zephyr, Kefir, evolve, uh, change, betterment, etc. Because when you did that process in the underworld, the process of judgment to reach uh, the afterlife in heaven, eternity, immortality, etc., well, that was also symbolized in the. Um, self-renewal of the sun, and when you renew yourself, when you put to death the falsity, you renew yourself, so you emerge from the underworld, from the, also the Greek and other uh, hero monomyths, where you reach the underworld, and then you uh, overcome an obstacle, so this one would be like facing yourself in the mirror and facing how you're a part of evil, and then putting to death that part of yourself which creates that evil, so you no longer create that evil, and then you've renewed yourself, you've evolved, 
Uh, you rolled out. You become so Kepper, Kefir, Zephyr, Zephyr, whatever. You become a new person. Hence, you've been resurrected and renewed as the sun is in the morning. And then you can go again and learn about aspects of falsity and truth as a higher self. Come back to sunset. Um, put to death. Is it put to death? Learn to put to death or go to death and then to the falsity and then, and then you actualize yourself away from that falsity as a new version of yourself and then you're reborn again in the morning, in the dawn. And it keeps repeating. This is the this is the ancient knowledge about ourselves that matters in life. Just go look at go look at the duat and uh, the halls of Ma'adi and the whole process of that of after you die and uh, going towards the west to reach the east of the uh, the land of reeds, the paradise. Yes, go read all that and tell me that it's literal and that the exoteric narrative is actually the literal truth of reality that all these things are, are real no it's symbolic learn symbolism until you do you will not understand things properly in reality you keep getting suckered into beliefs I've managed to let go of a lot of beliefs but I'm sure I'm still suckered in by a few of them because I still have more to learn So the four winds, the four corners, upholding the sky from the earth, Newt from Geb, is the air god Shu, symbol of light and the word, through the counterpart Hu. So it's symbolic of the light and the word, through the counterpart Hu, which Heliopolis or Thermopolis, I don't remember which one, but um, Hu was the same as Shu, and they're both the same as He, so He, eternity, in one place, and then Hu, um, was the word and logos in another place and then you have Shu as uh, another one upholding things because you had He upholding uh, you have Shu upholding and I think Hu Hu upholds things and you have Nun upholding things with their arms and sometimes with the sun there uh, Nun would uphold the barge I think Hu would do the same thing uh, Shu upholds Nut through which the barge goes through, so it's all different symbolism. Some of them are male, some of them are female. Uh, whatever, it depends, doesn't really matter in terms of understanding the core symbolism, but of course in uh, terms of central aspects of symbolism, it doesn't really fit uh, the counterpart. So you have, um, you know, also Ma'at and Thoth, the scribe and the word, the writing of words, and Seshat was the inventor of words, and Thoth was the writer of words, and it corresponds to, um, so Hugh, you had, uh, was the divine utterance, which also was Shu, the first one from the, the mouth of God, either as a spitting out from his own ejaculate, or from his shadow that he took in and made the first gods, whatever, there's different creation myths and they're all anthropomorphized, personified, and projected ridiculous notions of creation myths. It's pretty obvious to see. Um, so yeah, the Shu was described as the four winds and symbolic of the four corners upholding the sky from the earth. That's why I mentioned that. And you can see the the four corners of the earth and all this ancient symbolism, I'm not too familiar with it, but uh, you know, the four corners and the four winds, same type of thing. And Shu was representative of that. So the power of Ka and the word, the truth, is the way and path to the heavens and the sun. In addition to the power that keeps heaven from crashing into hell, the sky from crashing into earth. So Shu as the word, as the light, he was also uh, Shu and Tefnut as the the eye, the first eye, which was the produced the first light in the darkness to go look for uh, Shu and Tefnut, which were lost, the first uh, children of Atom. So he sent his eye out to go look for them, which was the first um, aspect of light. And then in another myth, it has. Uh, there was no light for the eye to see, or the eye, the eye wasn't light, so then Shu had to um, 
create light. And that's why he's associated with the heat aspect of the air, because uh, he's it was the first light. He, he uttered the light somehow into creation. I forget the, the creation myth, which one it was. Anyways, it's so confusing going through <laughs> Egyptian creation myths. There's so many in different places and overlapping and changing over time. It's just, just look at the symbolism and see what the symbolism says. Forget whether the ancient Egyptians understood the wisdom behind it, whether they believed in it exoterically or esoterically, whether it was only the populace that understood the esoteric and the priests understood, um, the populace understood the exoteric and then only the priests understood the esoteric. Whatever, it doesn't really matter for the symbolism that conveys understanding of reality that is there. You can see it in the symbolism. So that's what I mean. Go through the symbolism and don't go through what the Egyptologists are telling you that they understand because they lack understanding of, of alchemy and, and esoteric wisdom. So they can't describe it to you in the proper way. And they're describing it to you in an exoteric way. You know, don't go through the exoteric. Go through the esoteric symbolic decoding. All right. So I guess that's pretty clear. Number 28. Here's some more dual symbolism. So we have the dual two truths, the spirits, the, the two spirits, the two truths. Again, as I mentioned, one and two. So we have good and evil. And that can be um, symbolized as going from four from the two, as I mentioned before. When, when you uh, take the two and you cross it over, it produces four. And if you do two times four, it produces eight. So x times, and also times of 8, and 8 is infinity, and if you take times, well that's also infinity, in terms of time, if you put two more lines on it, on each end. So the 4 from the 2 uh, is also truth and justice in terms of the two witnesses of the same type. So the two witnesses of good would be truth and justice, and the two witnesses of evil is, I guess, falsity and injustice. So you have the two different ways of looking at it. The two truths of the, the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil, the truth of good and the truth of evil. Or you can also look at it as the two truths, as the two witnesses of truth and justice. Now also, uh, good and evil, when you're crossing over symbolism and passing over, um, you're, you're also crossing over and passing over is putting to death the evil inside of you, as well as... Um, the symbolism of uh, the four from the two and the four elements, where one, two, and three, four from the one and two that cross, and you have the fifth in the middle, which I've gone through at the beginning of this. Uh, this is a crossing over. It's a passing over, where you're going to um, join the knowledge of good and evil, or also where you're going to engage in the process of the quaternity of quartering um, reality and yourself, where you go from uh, fire desires to air thoughts, water deeds and actions to earth results and consequences, you're going to engage in that crossing over where you're going to bear your own cross. You're going to take up the responsibility, as I've mentioned in those earlier infographics. You're going to take up the own cross to bear reality yourself, to bear good and evil yourself, and you're going to bear your own cross to, to create yourself in reality to create in reality yourself and to create yourself in reality, to bear your own cross in how you create yourself and in how you create as a reflection of yourself in reality. So who you are as you and who you are acting in reality as your actions and deeds. So there's the knowledge of the two spirits of good and evil, such as the tree of, um, applied as a system and model for living, as quartering the circle, or squaring the circle. The quaternity, this is to bear your own cross, to, the activate, uh, to activate the self, soul, and consciousness, to a more actualized, realized, and individuated self, soul, consciousness, through the knowledge of good and evil, where you're crossing over and passing over the knowledge of good and evil, you're crossing it over and bearing your own cross, or also you're crossing over to the other side. What other side? Well, usually it's you're crossing over and passing over into death, right? 
But what is all this life and afterlife and eternal life symbolism as I've been describing over and over? It has to do with the real life, the actual life, the truer life, the realer, the more authentic life. So crossing over and passing over is where you're actually crossing over from the old world to the new world, from the old self to the new self, from a more of a false self to more of a truer self, realer self, higher self. That's the real crossing over, the passing over. In real life, in here and now, in the life, from birth to death, this is how it happens. This is the real, symbolic, meaningful crossing over and passing over. Now, the exoteric crossing over and passing over is completely useless in life. You're going to use that as a term for what? Simply dying when, you, when you're dead and you're not in life anymore to do anything? You're going to use that as a symbol? Okay. But it's meaningless in this life. So... Crossing over and passing over has deep meaning once you understand what it means in this life, here and now, that we live in. When you understand all of this symbolic death symbolism and symbolic eternal life and immortality and paradise and heaven, it all relates to the same thing. But you got to understand what this, uh, these wisdom uh, teachings and traditions are conveying. It's not exoteric, literal aspects now and I also have here uh, a cross 1 to 7 7 to 1 in terms of good the seven spirits of good 1 to 7 the first and the last the first and the seventh uh, truth and justice the two witnesses or the other way you know in evil it would be falsity to injustice so there's another way of looking for of something else Here's some more dual symbolism, infographic 29. So, infographic 29. This is more symbolism linking 2 to 4. So again, we have 1 and 2 lines crossing over to the X. So we have below that, 2 lines, goes over to the X. What's in the middle? Well, that's the fifth point. So we have the fifth point as a dot. Then we can move it over to the fifth point as a circle. And then it looks like Tower Cross. All right, not the Tower Cross, the, the Celtic Cross symbolism. Then you go over even more. Well, let's straighten it out. Ah, then it looks even more like the Celtic Cross and Sun symbolism. And then you go even more and you expand the circle all the way to the perimeters of the lines. And then what do you end up with? And then you end up with the Sun symbolism. So I've gone from the two lines, the 11, the 1 to 1 ratio, cause and effect, 11, justice, the first and last, the two witnesses, the first and the seventh. And that goes from 11, and it produces the, the sun. The two lines produce the sun symbolism, which contains uh, the quaternity, the quartering of the circle, squaring the circle symbolism. Um, it contains uh, the four elements, uh, and all the other stuff I've been talking about, how to live life. So you can view the foundation of that, you know, you can view it in one way as the one and two lines as good and evil. You cross them and that develops our understanding of reality, yes, of good and evil. Of creating in evil or creating in good. And then with that knowledge of good and evil as earth and air, then we can apply it through the fire, earth, water, uh, fire, air, earth, water symbolism in terms of uh, the quaternity of consciousness and generating in reality. And also at the bottom here I have more symbolism. So we have the circle with the two lines. And then if you take those two lines, you bring them inward. Well, then it creates that sun cross symbolism. And then if you put a square instead of a circle, well, you're going to get a square, which I've already shown in uh, the previous one on uh, how I've likened it to a pyramid and uh, the, the compass directional. So... We're going to get that at, at the, the last image. It looks like, uh, you know, the compass directional um, little uh, triangles that indicate each compass point. So a circle to the square. The square, you put the circle around it. And then if you take out the, the lines from the circle, then you have um, 
squaring the circle. So you can have the circle with the cross in it. You can have the square with the cross in it. So if you put the two together, the cross with the square and the circle, you end up with the circle, square, and cross. Now, if you have the circle, square, and cross, and you take away the cross, which was what it was a common factor in both the circle and cross and the square and the cross, you take away the cross, what you're left with is uh, squaring the circle symbolism. And squaring the circle symbolism, instead of uh, rounded, four rounded points, if you had um, triangles representative of the infolded aspect of a pyramid, if you outfolded, unfolded a pyramid from the, the four points flatward, well, you would end up with the last symbol here, which is the same thing as the squaring the circle of four bisected points. You have four more bisected points, it's just they're all at right angles instead of circular. And, um, oh, there's the compass symbol as well, in a way. So, infographic 30 is with more dual symbolism. So we have here, I'm just going more in detail, in the two witnesses, the truth, which is the first, and justice as the seventh and the last. So the seven spirits of good are bounded by the first two. So the two witnesses, the two truths, the first and the last. The five others are in between. So we also have symbolism of, um, well, I was going to say the planets, the first and the last. And that would be Saturn. Well, yeah, because, you know, justice and Saturn and the law are symbolically associated. So the first and the last, the first and the seventh, since we had um, the sun as the first, we'll say, the sun as the first, and the sun was the light and also symbolic of the truth, as are the, star, the stars, the light and symbolic of truth. So here's the first, the sun as the first, and then the seventh, as the seventh planet in the ancient system, which was Saturn, which was Kronos, and that was time. So, here we have justice, because Saturn, as justice, is what we have in the courts. Um, all the courts, and the black robes, and it's all Saturnalia, Saturn symbolism, well, that's related to justice. So here we can look at it in terms of um, the first and last, in terms of the seven symbolism, the seven ancient planets, the first being the, the sun, symbolized of the light and the truth, and the last being um, Saturn as the seventh and last, and the justice. So we have the two spirits, dual, so we have one plus one equals two, and we have a one and a one makes eleven, and another way to get eleven is seven plus four. As I've mentioned, with Amon Ra's headdress of seven feathers and four rows of seven feathers, seven and four. So the first pillar is truth, and the last pillar, justice, of the seven spirits expressible through four elements of living. It also can be dual, uh, two spirits of light and dark, of uh, seven good and seven evil spirits, which gives you fourteen. Um, from these two dualities that come from uh, 11 of the spirits of good and evil and of the encapsulation of the seven good spirits from truth which is the first to justice and seven so we have one one which is the two dualities that come from the one one of truth and falsity or uh, good and evil I mean so the spirits of good and evil from the one one and then you have the encapsulation from the one one Within the good, you have the first and the last. Within the, the good, the two spirits, good and evil. When you look at good, well, there's two, the two ends, the first and the last of good, truth, and justice. And then in the falsity, the spirit of falsity, the other one, well, you have another 11 in there of two ones of the first and the last of falsity and injustice. So again, we have the sun disk symbol of the circle with the dot and the two lines. Um, you have the two lines again with two, and you have um, four objects. You have two lines, one circle and one dot, so that's four objects. And the seven, um, I guess, symbolic of the, the central uh, core kernel source as being uh, a symbolic representation of the, the seven in between. So the, the kernel source would be uh, 
of, of the good. So that one thing, the good, within the good there are seven, and the first and the last is truth and justice. So you have the, the one line on one side and the one line on the other side, truth and justice, and in the middle and the sun is representative of them both, and which we'll see in image number 32, infographic 32 coming up, first we'll get to infographic 31. So this is to reiterate um, the central point which I mentioned in passing in terms of righteousness, because the first and last is done through the middle. So again, the importance of the middle, you know, red and green in the middle of the spectra, uh, red and blue spectrum in the middle is green, uh, the heart symbol of the middle of our body, but all it is is symbolism. Green is just symbolism. Heart is just symbolism. It's not literally the heart. It's not literally the color green. It's only symbolism, okay? Symbols. It's all symbols. So the first, truth, the last, seven. What's in the middle? The middle, the center, the heart. Righteousness, acting in right, righteousness. So desire and care for first and last, truth and justice, lives in righteousness. When you care for truth and you care for justice, you care for doing right, and you're a righteous person. This is the heart, core, center of a human being, to stand for what is right. What is true care? Uh, sorry. This is true care, care for truth and morality, true, quote, heart, true courage to act in what's right. That's having the heart and the courage to do what's right, acting in, in what's right, righteousness. That's what becoming a truer, truer self, a realer self, a higher self is about. So righteousness, the, the ma'at scale, is if the heart equals truth and justice, then you have righteous living, real living, as a living, true living, higher living, heaven, afterlife, etc. That's what it's all about. If your heart balances out to truth and justice on the other side, then you're in balance. And you have the real life, the truer life, the higher life, heaven, afterlife, the righteous life, etc. So with heart, it's the ib, it's the mind, thoughts, desires. On truth and justice, you develop righteousness and courage to stand in what is right over wrong, becoming a truer self, a realer self, higher self, more authentic self, etc. This is the quintessence. Heart, soul, spirit, core, center of man, etc. We also have uh, the shining eye symbolism, which was righteousness of, of uh, putting things right and justice and injustice, Kalimat, uh, the, the eye of Ra, the eye of Horus. And you also have flaming heart symbolism in a lot of uh, depictions of Jesus, the flaming heart, I believe. Um, there's a burning candle symbolism, the seven burning candles in uh, biblical, the seven wisdoms, seven pillars of wisdom burning candles, uh, the menorah, the Jewish menorah, which is uh, a symbol for the Kabbalah, again, seven, um, I think there's seven lines, there's ten sephiroth, but um, there's seven, if you go horizontally and connect them, there's the first one, there's the next two, um, there's the next two, the next two, and then there's one, and there's one alone, I don't know if that made six or seven, maybe the uh, duat, da'ath, I think it's Da'ath in Kabbalah, yeah, not Du'ath. Da'ath, or Da'at, whatever, the invisible one above the heart chakra, it's uh, underneath or below the the tree of life, which is where it emanates from or something, I forget all that symbolism, but anyways, there's seven lines when you do the, the tree of life, there's three, three pillars, but there's uh, the seven lines. Um, all right, I guess that's enough for that. So we'll go infographic number two. Uh, sorry, number 32. Infographic number 32 deals with more symbolism of the duels. So the two cobras, the uraeus, whenever you see that, two candlesticks, two pillars, two witnesses, uh, two spirits, two horns, the sun in between as the fire, heat, and the light. Well, here I'm showing this is one image I've remade. You know, I've made two horns or capturing devices with the sun in the middle. Well, that's... Here's a, a depiction from Egyptian symbolism itself with the horns and the sun being captured in the middle. So you can see this in, in uh, the images I've added here. That's probably Isis. So you have uh, holding the Ka again, 
the ka of life, derived from the power of the, the ka and the horns, uh, uh, in the sun of the, the truth and the light and justice and the heat. And you have the Uraeus serpent um, around the, the sun. And in the hands, you have the ankh being pushed to the nose or the mouth as the breath of life, real life. So it's all being derived from truth through us expressing it and pushing it into other people, pushing the truth into other people through the symbol of the Ankh, which is life, the breath of life. So the air symbolism, sun symbolism, sky, heaven, all that is all real life, the afterlife, the immortal life, the eternal life, and that's being given to someone else. Symbolically. And here I have, um, so at the top, let's finish with some other stuff. The two spirits of truth and justice, the first and last, last one and seven, alpha and omega, allude to all seven in between, the first and the seventh. Um, I'll be getting more into the alpha and omega symbolism regarding Aleph and Tau and the bull symbolism and how it's all related to the bull. The bull is central in terms of development of our alphabet. It all comes from the bull and it all comes from Egypt. At least as the earliest source derivation that we can find in historical work, which only goes up, you know, 6,000 years from now, backwards from now. We don't have historical records from pre-Ice Age, pre pre-Ice Age, pre-Flood civilization, etc. So again, the sun symbol with the dot and the two lines, so you have the sun and the two lines again, see that the horns and the ka holding the sun in, well that's the, the two lines holding the sun symbol in, same same symbolism, just described in a different way, but same symbolism. So you have at the bottom right uh, the, the, the Uraeus serpents, two of them, uh, around the sun, and this time each of them has a, a headdress, I don't know, I think one means uh, Upper Egypt, one means Lower Egypt, white and red, I'm not sure, don't hold me to that. And also each of them has the Ankh of life, they're holding it. And uh, on the right, the other ones you've seen, on the right we have uh, the bull and the horns and the sun symbolism. Again, it's all talking about the same thing. You have the, tool, the dual things, the dual of your hands, of the horns, of the lions, whatever, there's a dual, and then there's a sun being held up or in between the dual or the dual snakes or the dual candlesticks or the dual pillars, and then there's a sun in the middle holding it up. All right, so we'll go on to infographic 33. Oh wait, I forgot to read the bottom left corner. So two spirits doubled make four elements. Four elements from seven spirits is 11 total. I've mentioned that before. Seven spirits from the two spirits. That'll give you uh, 14. 11 is two pillars. 11 is two. 11 is two dualism requires truth and justice, the two main spirits and virtues and morals. Truth and justice. So that's 11, Tarot 11, Justice, Truth and Justice. The virtues, morals, they, they, they contain the, the seven virtues and morals, however many you want to think of. You know, they're in, symbolically encapsulated between the truth and light and the justice, the heat. Um, okay, so I guess that's it. On to Infographic 33. So this deals with um, the... Uh, The, the horse of the two horizons I was talking about, and the lioness of Shu and Tefnut, and Shu and the other masculine aspect of te, uh, Tefnut, or Tefnut, and Nephthys, or Tefnut, and Isis, or Maat, and Isis, or the Isis, or Hathor, and two lionesses. It's symbolism of the two, of the setting and the rising of Horus, as you can see in this picture here. We have Akar, or Akar, which is the deified horizon which already a Heraktu, or I forget the, the name, but of the Horus of the Two Horizons, type that in Google, you can find it. Um, this is also uh, Akar, uh, Akar, the Deified Horizon, also called Ruti, the Two Lions. So the Two Lions, uh, symbolic, you can find that in 
Shu and Tefnut and other aspects and other goddesses. Um, it's symbolic in uh, two eyes of Ra, uh, setting and rising sun, and also um, the Duao, which means yesterday and tomorrow. So one lion is looking backwards to yesterday, and one lion is looking forward to tomorrow. Now, um, I'll just mention this. Um, Cinderessis and uh, Sinaitisis. Sinaitisis and Cinderessis were aspects of uh, moral study where one is you look at actions in the past to determine what was done and to help guide you for actions in the future, which is again what we're talking about um, in terms of, of uh, earlier infographics I did in this presentation with uh, the, the dual cause symbolism infographic 21 or 22 I forget um, where you don't learn from your past mistakes where you follow the wrong path the left hand path and keep doing evil or you do the right hand path and you learn from your mistakes and you go into entropy uh, sorry entropy uh, syntropy and you evolve and you better yourself as opposed to the left hand path of of uh, entropy and stagnation and no history and not learning your mistakes and just keep repeating the same things over and over and over the same mistakes so you learn from your mistakes in order to not do them in the future you learn from where you've gone wrong so that you can go right truth or consequence be right or go wrong and when you do wrong you learn from it so that you can do the right the next time so that you don't repeat the same mistake. The symbolism is also in, in a part of this, a part of the sun symbolism, part of the setting and the rising, part of what was yesterday. When the sun set, well, that's the end of, of what was yesterday. And when the sun rises, well, that's what's, what's, what's coming tomorrow. The sun rises tomorrow and the sun set was yesterday. It's aspects of looking into our past and looking into the future, looking into the past actions, looking into the future actions, the past actions to uh, guide us in our future actions, which is where senderesis and uh, sinaitesis and senderesis, this is contained in my work on characters and our character, maybe on um, axioms, existence, consciousness, and identity, maybe. And was do a search on my site for cinderesis and uh, or cinderesis and sinaitesis and there's two articles where I talk about this and I've done an audio on it to expound upon it I just can't remember where it is what the title of it but if you do a search on my site or a, a Google search of my site then you'll be able to find it so again just relating uh, the sun symbolism left and right uh, the winged goddesses, uh, the winged uh, beetle with the two hands above holding the sun, um, you have the Uraeus serpent uh, left and right facing the, the before and after, um, the sun symbolism in the wings, it's all very related. All right, infographic number 34. Here's where I said I'd have more uh, infographics on uh, Nut and uh, Gab upholding being up, upheld and separated by Shu and the Ankh. And number 35 is where I also said I'd have more on Newt. You can see the scarab beetle uh, coming out holding the sun out of the vagina, how it makes its trek across from uh, the, the night to the morning, its rebirth in Newt. This is uh, depictions of Newt, and you have Newt with the solar barge, uh, and you have uh, you can see how Newt is a representation of the Milky Way, I have a picture there of Milky Way, the sunrise, or it could be sunset, not sure. Maybe it's sunset, because I think they're in the southern hemisphere, so the sunrise would be on the right, and that represents Nut. That's the goddess Nut as the Milky Way, as the waters above and the waters below, the Nile, um, the sky, uh, the waters of heaven and the waters of earth. And you also have uh, Hathor as the cow goddess, and uh, she's being upheld by uh, either uh, Shu or Nut uh, or Nun, and uh, the sun solar barge goes through uh, Hathor and the cow and all that symbolism, 
and you have it, uh, the cow with the horns and the sun on the foundational Ben Ben or Ma'at with the lion and Horus, uh, eagle head. And uh, yeah, so that's the part one of the presentation. I'm, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much if you did. It's a very long but important information. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a nice day. Take care. Peace.